Scholastic Audio presents Spirit Animals, Book Two, Hunted, by Maggie Stevotter, read by Nicola Barber. Chapter 1. Bile The forest was dark and full of animals. The night between the trees clicked and growled and fluttered. In the small light of a lantern, a man and a boy stood and stared at a tiny flask. Although the flask itself was unimpressive, the solution inside was remarkable, a powerful substance that could force a bond between a human and a spirit animal. Will it hurt? The boy, Devon Trunswick, asked. He was handsomely dressed, and there was an arrogant, cruel tilt to his chin that fear couldn't erase. A lord's son, he would never admit he was afraid of the dark, even if there was plenty to be afraid of. The man, Zerif, pulled back the embroidered blue hood of his cape so the boy could see his eyes more clearly. Holding up the flask, he said, Does it matter? This is a privilege, little lordling. You'll be a legend. Devin liked the sound of that. Right now, he was the opposite of a legend. He came from a long line of marked individuals, people who had bonded with spirit animals, but when his turn had come, he had failed, breaking a chain that was generations long. At his nectar ceremony, the event where children who came of age drank from the green cloak's nectar of Ninani and hoped for the appearance of a spirit animal, he had summoned nothing. As if that wasn't bad enough, his own servant, a lowly shepherd boy, had called up a wolf. A wolf! And not just any wolf. The boy had summoned Brigan the wolf, one of the great beasts. Devin was stung by humiliation. But that humiliation was going to end. Now, an even more powerful animal would be delivered to him. He had prepared his whole life for this. It ran in his blood. This destiny had only been delayed, not destroyed. Why is it called bile? Devin asked, his eyes on the flask. That doesn't sound great. It's a joke, Sarif replied tersely. I don't see what's funny about it. You've tasted the nectar, right? Devin nodded, his face sour despite memories of its exquisite taste. Well, Zarif said, nose scrunching. You're about to taste the bile. Then you'll get the joke. I promise. The boy looked hurriedly over his shoulder as a growl muttered from the trees. Beside him, a spider with a hard, shiny back lowered itself down on a thread. He tried to stay out of its path. Whatever animal I call will have to listen to me, right? He asked. It will do whatever I say. Bonds with the bile are different from bonds with the nectar, Zarif informed him. The nectar might taste sweeter, but the bile is more useful. We can control much more of the process. For instance, you don't have to worry about bonding with that spider you've been so desperate to avoid. Devin bristled, annoyed that Zarif had noticed his terror. Loftily, he said, I'm not worried. But his eyes darted to the covered cage that waited for them. Beneath that cloth, was the animal he would bond with. He tried to guess what it could be from the size of the enclosure. The cage was large, up to his chest. Occasionally, he could hear scratching noises from underneath it. This was the animal he'd spend the rest of his life with, the animal that would make him triumph. Zarif handed the flask to the boy. His smile was as wide and encouraging as a jackal's. Just one sip will do it. 
the boy wiped his sweaty palms on his shirt. This was it. Nobody would ever question him again. Nobody would ever doubt his strength. He was not the Trunswick family's first failure. He was its first legend. Through the open top of the flask, the bile smelled dreadful, like hair burning. He remembered the glorious taste of the nectar, like butter over honey. It had been so remarkable, until it had gone wrong. Now he raised the flask to his lips, and without another thought, gulped down the bile. He had to fight hard not to gag. It was like drinking death itself, and the ground that death was buried in. But within that blackness, he felt something coming alive within him, something vast and strong and dark. His body could barely contain the thing that grew inside him. In that instant, he felt no terror. He only felt that he could create terror. Still smiling, Zerif whisked the cover off the cage. Chapter 2 Greenhaven I'm nearly ready, Urasa, Abeka said, slipping a bracelet over her slender brown hand. Her words were directed at the leopard that paced the floor of her room. Because the room was much too small for a leopard, or because the leopard was much too large for the room, the big cat could only take a few steps in each direction before she huffed and twisted the other way. Abeka could sympathize. In just a few short weeks, their world had shrunk from their home in wide open Nilo to a tangled training camp, and then shrunk again to this island fortress, Greenhaven, the headquarters of the Greencloaks, guardians of Erdos. Abeka supposed that the fortress was impressive, a sprawling stone castle built on top of a waterfall, but both she and Uraza were of the mind that the forest surrounding it looked more appealing. Outside the window, a bell sounded from a distant tower. Three tolls, the call to training. Uraza paced even harder, making low grunting sounds. All right, we'll go. Abeka tightened her bracelet so it wouldn't slip off. Although its strands looked like wire, they were actually boiled elephant tail hair. Four knots in the strands symbolized sun, fire, water and wind. Her perfect sister, Soma, had given it to her as she'd left home. It was supposed to bring good luck. But Abeka wasn't sure if good luck was really what she had been having since she left Nilo. She'd summoned a great beast as a spirit animal, which seemed like good luck. But almost immediately after that, she'd been recruited by people who were secretly in cahoots with the Devourer, enemy of the known world. Definitely bad luck. The green cloaks had agreed to take her in once she'd discovered her mistake. Abeka knew that she was probably supposed to consider that as good luck. After all, they hadn't had to let her switch sides. But it didn't feel very lucky at the moment. She'd made one friend since this whole thing began, Shane, and he was still on the other side, with the conquerors. She'd traded her only friend for three kids who didn't trust her. Really, Abeka would settle for the good luck of not getting lost in the giant green cloak fortress again. As she opened the door, she donned the green cloak that meant she had sworn to defend Erdos. The dim hallway was full of sound. A monkey screamed a laugh somewhere out of sight, and a man's voice rumbled low beneath it. A donkey brayed. Something like hoofbeats or pattering footsteps resonated through the stone walls. Abeka ducked as a bird the color of a banana soared overhead. At the sight of the bird, Uraza, however, leaped skyward with a gleeful and rather threatening growl. The banana-colored bird shrieked. Just before the leopard slapped her paws together, Abeka grabbed her tail. The leopard's leap was brought up short with a yowl. Uraza spun. For a moment, her teeth were instinctually bared and menacing. Abeka's heart stopped. Then the leopard realized it was Abeka's hand on her tail. Her lips lowered. 
She gave Rebecca a deeply wounded look. The bird flapped away. I apologize, Rebecca said, but that was someone's spirit animal. One would think a great beast would understand why it wasn't right to eat someone else's spirit animal. But with Uraza, sometimes the beast part outweighed the great part. Maybe we should do this, Abeka told Uraza, holding out her arm as a request. All spirit animals had the ability to enter a dormant form. If Uraza chose to enter it now, she would become a tattoo on Abeka's skin until they got to training. And tattoos had never eaten anyone else's spirit animal. But Uraza was tired of being cooped up. She considered Abeka's outstretched arm for one long moment, and then she turned and stalked down the hall. Abeka didn't press the issue. They were going to be late. As she hurried down the hallway after the leopard, various green cloaks waved and greeted her by name. Abeka felt bad that she couldn't return the favor, but they all knew her more than she knew them. All four of the newcomers at the fortress, Abeka, Rolan, Maylin, and Connor, were well known. The four kids who had somehow summoned the four fallen. Uraza made a curious trilling sound as she leaped down a circular stairwell in front of her. At the bottom, both Abeka and Uraza hesitated. They faced two identical halls, each with plaster white walls and exposed timber ceilings. Only one led to the training room. Uraza? Abeka asked. Uraza's violet eyes darted from the floor to the ceiling, her long tail thrashing slowly. Suddenly, Abeka didn't think she looked so much like a leopard deciding which way to go. Instead, she looked like a leopard about to... Uraza lunged. She was a muscled blur of gold and black as she pushed off the wall. A thrumming, heart-chilling growl burst from her. For one moment, Abeka just thought, what an amazing animal. Then she realized that Uraza was on the hunt. The leopard's unlucky prey crouched on a notch in the plaster wall. It was a small squirrel-like animal with pink feet, a striped back, and large eyes. Abeka thought it was a sugar glider. Uraza thought it was delicious. Uraza! Abeka snatched for the leopard's tail again, but missed. The sugar glider leaped toward the opposite wall. As it flew, its tiny limbs stretched out from its body. There was skin webbing between all its legs, making its body into a furry sail. Uraza pounced. The sugar glider darted out of her way. The two of them careened down the hall. The sugar glider soared onto a side table. Uraza knocked the furniture over. The sugar glider scrambled up a tapestry of Olvan, leader of the green cloaks. Uraza clawed the fabric from the wall. Tatters of Abeka's dignity fluttered to the ground. Helplessly, Abeka ran after them. She managed to get a hold of Uraza's back leg, but the leopard tugged free easily. Abeka was left with a handful of black and yellow hairs. The chase hurtled on. The three of them crashed through the hallway into a small eating room Abeka hadn't seen before. People filled the benches. Abeka took the long way around the diners as the sugar glider and Uraza tore across the long table. Plates flew. One man got a face full of his oatmeal. Another diner shut her eyes against an onslaught of fruit. Outrage had just been added to the breakfast selection. Abeka felt the green cloak's eyes. She wanted to shout, It's her fault, not mine! But she knew what their responses would be. It's up to you to control your spirit animal. Can't you control her? This is your responsibility. This is your failure. Maybe you don't belong here, after all. There was no time for her to apologize or clean up the damage. She panted after the animals as they darted and clawed through several twisted hallways and a large room full of chairs, ending up in a foyer with an arched doorway on the other side. The sugar glider was making panicked, pitiful noises that sounded like a squeaky rocking chair. Abeka was gasping too. 
Back in Nilo, she could track animals for hours without feeling she had taken a breath. What was this castle doing to her? Uraza, she said, grabbing a stitch in her side. We're supposed to be here to save the world, so save your appetite. This made Uraza pause. The sugar glider had just enough time to hurl itself to the safety of the chandelier. Both a becker and the sugar glider breathed a sigh of relief. Araza circled below, but the chase was over. Now, Abeka thought with dismay, we are really lost. Being lost wasn't the worst consequence, either. Being late was. Not because it came with a steep penalty, her instructors were fairly understanding, but she knew her tardiness would only deepen the problems between her and the other three kids. They had begun their training together, while Abeka had still been in the clutches of the devourer. She was not only the outsider, she was the suspicious ex-enemy. She could only imagine what they thought she was doing right now. Spying somewhere in the castle, sending secret messages to Zarif the Conqueror who'd taken her away after her nectar ceremony, letting Uraza eat someone else's spirit animal. She had to get to that training room. Maybe there was someone inside that arched doorway who could help her find her way. Even if the room was empty, there was something tempting about the curved entry. Although it surely led to another room, something about it felt as if it led to the outside instead. Rebecca couldn't quite explain the sensation to herself. Cautiously, she pushed the door open. Inside was a dim room she'd never seen before. It was cluttered with musical instruments, mysterious pieces of art, and mirrors. There was a pile of drums as tall as a becker, a piano-like instrument the size of a dog, and a bin full of flutes and recorders. A portrait of a girl smiled at her from one wall, while a mural of a man leading dozens of unfamiliar animals through a field, covered another. The room smelled like dust and wood and leather, but also, to a becker's delight, like the outdoors, though, again, she couldn't explain why. A single man stood inside, partially turned away. It was possible his spirit animal was in its passive state, but Rebecca realized quickly that she wouldn't be able to tell. Apart from his face, every inch of visible pale skin was covered in tattoos. Inked mazes, circles, stars, moons, knots, stylized creatures. The mark of his spirit animal wouldn't stand out from the rest of the designs all over his body. Rebecca was suddenly impressed. Whether it was the man's intention or not, he had very cleverly hidden the identity of his spirit animal. Even though what she could see of his face seemed young, his hair was grey, nearly white. He didn't seem to have noticed her silent entrance. His eyes downcast, he continued whispering to himself. Abeka couldn't quite make out the words, but it sounded like coaxing. She suddenly felt like she'd interrupted something quite secret, almost sacred. And in that dim, mirrored room, it was also just a little eerie. She backed out. She'd find her own way back to training. In the foyer, Uraza waited, her tail curled tidily around her own feet. Abeka didn't have to tell the leopard she was upset with her. Uraza knew Without a word, Rebecca held out her arm, and without a moment's hesitation, Uraza became a tattoo on her skin. It only stung for a second. Rebecca started on her way. Back in Nilo, she had been known for her tracking skills, hadn't she? She would find the training room, and she would make it her business to not get lost again. The training room was the second largest room in Greenhaven Castle, it was bright and inviting, 
and had a dazzlingly tall peaked ceiling for the high-flying spirit animals. One end of the room was devoted to weapons storage, spears, maces, slingshots, anything you might hope to find, so long as it would leave a mark. Stained glass windows lined the walls, each one featuring a different great beast. As she stepped in, Abeka was uncomfortably aware of suspicious eyes on her. Rolan, the scruffy orphan who had summoned Essex the falcon, frowned at her. Maylin, standing near the panda G, kept her striking face intentionally expressionless. Only Connor, the blonde boy with pale skin who had summoned Brigan the wolf, offered a faint smile in Abeka's direction. Tariq, the green cloak who was in charge of their training and their futures, stood in front of a folded fabric screen. His weathered, lean face was only a little lighter than Abeka's. Right now it wore a perplexed frown. Abeka, didn't you hear the training bell? There was no point blaming it on Uraza. She knew what Tariq would say. You're going to have to learn to work with Uraza in far more difficult situations than our hallways. And she didn't want to give the others more reasons not to trust her. Abeka said, I'm sorry, I got lost. She hurriedly released Uraza from her arm. Lost? Maylin rolled her eyes. She turned to Tariq. Now can we start? Every minute we stand here doing nothing, a city in Jong falls to the conquerors. That's a lot of cities, Rolan interjected. Do you mean eleven cities have fallen while we've stood here? How many do you think fell during breakfast? That was nearly twenty minutes. How? Rolan, that is no joking matter, Tariq said. And Maylin is right. Time is precious. But I think it will be more efficient if we train together. Today, you'll engage in hand-to-hand combat with other green cloaks. Maylin smirked, certain of her abilities. I call dibs on the mace, Roland said, and the brass knuckles. Not so fast, Tariq said. As he spoke, four other green cloaks entered the room. Though their spirit animals were in passive form, the four newcomers held their arms in such a way to display their tattoos to the four kids, like the green cloaks were introducing the animals, even though they weren't physically present. There was a llama, a fruit bat, a lemur, and a mountain lion. Tariq continued, You won't always have access to weapons. In fact, an attack will more often come when you're not ready, while you're sleeping or eating, so you will not be using those weapons. He pulled aside the folded screen behind him. The wall behind it was hung with frying pans, broomsticks, plates, pillows, and other ordinary objects. He said, You'll be using these. Oh, I did that every day in my old life, Roland joked. This is ridiculous, Malin argued. Maybe a street urchin is willing to fight with these crude tools, but I could do better with my bare hands. Abeka exchanged a look with Connor. They both moved to the wall to get weapons. Neither bothered complaining. Grab the first one you come to, Tariq said, and when I whistle, change to another object. Abeka took a broomstick. Connor took a fork. Here, Roland said, offering Maylin a handkerchief from the wall. This one won't scratch up your noble hands. Maylin smiled prettily, removing the frying pan she handed it to him. And here's one for you. Doesn't require much brains to figure out how to use it. Roland pretended to bow. Everyone to their marks, Tariq ordered. They took their places, the other green cloaks opposite. A becker faced a middle-aged man with a lemur tattoo and friendly-looking wide eyes. The sword he held was not quite so friendly-looking. I'm Errol, the man said touching his chest. My name is Abeka, Abeka replied. He smiled warmly at her. I know. Tariq's voice rose above the introductions. Older team, keep your spirit animals in passive form. Younger team, you may use all powers you have at your disposal. The object is to disarm your opponent, and if you manage that, to pin them to the ground. 
For how long? Maylin asked. How will we know if we've won? There is no win or lose here, Maylin, Tariq replied. We don't have time for games. What I want is for you to show me that you can neutralize an opponent so I feel more comfortable putting you in a real-life dangerous situation. Now, are we ready? Three, two. Putting his fingers to his lips, he let out a sharp, piercing whistle. The training battle began. Right away, Rebecca knew that her broomstick would be no match for Errol's sword. So, drawing on her past in Nilo, she hurled her broomstick like a spear, The stick bounced harmlessly off his chest. Grinning at her, he picked it up. I'll let you have one free pass, Errol said, offering her the broomstick. In the background, iron clanged, and Roland swore joyously. But remember, that thing doesn't have a point on it. If you tossed it at me in a real fight, you'd just end up empty-handed as I came at you with my blade. Abeka's cheeks felt warm. Of course, but well thrown, he said. Here's a hint. Use that broomstick defensively and count on your spirit animal as your weapon. And the other way around, if you find yourself with a real weapon. Thanks, she said. Then, suspicious of his kind smile, she added, don't go easy on me. That wouldn't be a favor, Errol said. We want you prepared when you get out there. Don't go easy on me. Abeka stole a glance at the others. Mei Lin sat on the shoulders of her opponent, the silk handkerchief wrapped around her assailant's eyes. If Mei Lin can do so well with just a scrap of cloth, Abeka thought, I have to be able to work with a broom. This time, when Errol came at her with the sword, she used the broom like a long staff instead, blocking his blows as best as she could. His strikes became steadily harder, though, and the broom handle began to splinter. Sorry, Rebecca said. He looked confused. For what? For this! With a pang of conscience, Rebecca thrust the broom bristles into the swordsman's face. Sneezing, he swatted at the noxious cloud of dust, hair, and animal fur surrounding his head. He blindly windmilled his sword. Well, he said not to go easy on him. Uraza, Abeka called. Now! Just as Errol's sword split her broomstick in two, shards flying, the leopard pounced. Her paws clapped on his chest. With a grunt, he fell back, catching himself with his hands. His sword clattered away. Uraza licked a paw serenely. Errol gave Abeka a thumbs up from his place on the floor. Abeka smiled at him. It was nice to feel accepted. Tariq's whistle sounded. New weapon, he shouted. Now, this round, I want you fighting as a team. Hurry, grab something, quick. Abeka snatched up a heavy wooden mixing bowl. Connor took a spoon. Maylin and Roland argued over a vase. Maylin ended up with the porcelain bottom, and Roland ended up with the dry flowers inside it. Wait, Roland said. Tariq let out his shrill whistle. As a team, go. This time, all four green cloaks attacked at once, and the four kids moved as one against them. Rebecca's wooden bowl served well as a shield. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw Connor and Brigan working together, darting forward and back. Smart, thought Rebecca. Connor's been taking his training to heart. He would be prepared even if he was surprised out in the open with no weapon at all. In fact, She was awed by their progress. Although he and Brigham had been gradually improving at each training session, this was a huge leap forward. Suddenly, the older green cloaks changed tactics, turning to a becker at the same time. She found herself facing two swords, a spear, and an axe, impossible to hold off on her own, even with Uraza. Uraza snaked beneath a green cloak, her flexible body low to the ground. One paw darted out, claws sheathed safely away. The green cloak with the llama tattoo careened to the ground, unbalanced. Abeka used her bowl to knock back the bat-tattooed green cloak. 
Uraza sprang onto his shoulders effortlessly. The weight of the big cat brought him to his knees. But the success was short-lived. The other two green cloaks came at her while Uraza was occupied. Errol's sword smacked her bowl right out of her hands. As it flew up into the air, the other green cloak slammed her with the broad side of his training axe, hard enough to throw her to the ground and knock the breath out of her. Her becker gasped as her palms scuffed over the floor. Tariq's whistle shrieked. It sounded a little irritated, louder and longer than usual. What was that? Tariq demanded. This was not a spectator event. Where were you three? How could you let her go down like that? Connor had the good manners to look ashamed. Roland acted like it simply hadn't occurred to him to help. Maylin's carefully painted face remained haughty. They didn't explain themselves, but they didn't have to. They don't trust me, Abeka thought, her eyes prickling with tears. The days of the other's distrust piled up inside her, along with the ache of her scuffed palms and the humiliation of having been so badly beaten. She wouldn't cry in front of them, especially not in front of Maylin. She was sure Maylin didn't cry over anything. I'm deeply disappointed, Tariq said. Part of good strategy is making good use of all your assets. Abeka is one of your assets, and you should have protected her. Connor offered his hand to Abeka. She hesitated before accepting it. He hauled her up. Sorry, he said. On the other end of the room, footsteps rang out through the uncomfortable silence. It was Olvan, the regal leader of the Green Cloaks. As always, his movements were slow and deliberate. There was something imposing about him, even when his spirit animal, a moose, wasn't visible. Rubbing his beard, he surveyed the wreckage. Shattered glass, broken broomsticks, dried flower petals. Tariq, I don't like to interrupt, but this is important. Go ahead, Tariq said. He was still frowning at three of his four pupils. When he nodded at the four green cloaks, they nodded back and exited. Errol waved to Abeka as he left. It was kind enough that it made her want to cry again. We've confirmed that one of the great beasts is in the north of Eura, Olven said. Rumphus the boar. It's not a far journey from here. The four of you and the fallen must travel immediately to find out more. Tariq, you will lead them again. Yes, Roland said. Finally, let's leave all this cutlery behind. Tariq's brow furrowed. I don't know much about the north. Olvan seemed unconcerned. I'll be sending Finn with you. He's from that area and can act as a guide. Finn, Tariq echoed. He didn't add anything else, but the single word was enough to make Olvan raise a thick eyebrow. It was unlike Tariq to question Olvan. Concerns, Tariq, Olvan asked brusquely. But his tone didn't seem to encourage a confession. Tariq merely shook his head. It will be good to have another set of hands, Malin said. Finn was once a great warrior, but now he's seen too much battle, Tariq answered carefully. He will only be useful as a scout. But a very good scout, Olvan insisted. He will not fight for you, but he will stand by you. There can be no question of that. Here he is. Finn entered the room with footfalls much softer than Olven's had been. Rebecca's head darted up. At once her humiliation was forgotten, replaced by interest. Finn was the tattooed man from the mirrored room, and their lives would soon be in his hands. Chapter 3 Letter The first thing Connor did to get ready for the journey was head to the kitchen. He didn't have a problem existing in dirty clothing or without weapons, as long as he had enough food to last the trip. The cool basement kitchen was dug right into the rock foundation of the fortress, and it was very full. 
Greenhaven required quite a lot of cooks. Not only were there a lot of green cloaks, there were more than a few spirit animals with very strange diets. So Connor tried to grab jerky, crackers and dehydrated fruit from under elbows and over shoulders and around hips. He had to keep saying, excuse me, and I'm sorry, and oh, was that your eye? Oh, love, said one of the cooks, a woman who looked a lot like a decorative pillow. We will do that for you. You are too good to be in the kitchen. Oh, no, Connor protested fervently. The kitchen was one of the only places in Greenhaven where he felt remotely comfortable. He came from a shepherd family and, until the last year or so, had grown up in fields. It wasn't the easiest life, but it was simple, and he'd been good at it. He knew his place, and it wasn't this magnificent fortress. This kitchen was closer. Oh, yes, the cook replied with a laugh. You've bonded with a great beast. You're destined for greatness. With a hint of panic, Connor shoved some more jerky into his pack. The idea that he was destined for greatness was not a cosy one. His former noble employer, Devon Transwick, would certainly have argued against it. Look, the messenger boat's come in, called an older, bearded cook. Peering out of the small window, he beckoned for Connor to join him. The fortress sat up high above the shore, and though the beach was not close, the building's lofty vantage point let Connor see all the way down to where a small boat had scuffed onto the rocky sand. In the afternoon light, two messengers climbed out. One walked purposefully toward the castle, but the other began to run, heading for the main entrance of the fortress. Why run? Connor wondered with a frown. What is the hurry? As Connor watched the two messengers, the cooks took advantage of his distraction to pack his bag full of food, including a large bone for Brigan. A few minutes later, the running messenger disappeared around the side of the fortress, and the other, to his surprise, came right to the kitchen. She had a mailbag, and one of the letters was for Connor. Connor accepted the letter, trying to keep the shock off his face. He knew very few people who would write to him. Although he was close to his family and their small farming community, none of the peasantry could read or write very well. In all the time he'd served the Transwicks, he'd only received a single letter from his family. They'd paid a week's earnings to hire the Finley girl, who was training to be a scribe, to scratch it all down. The younger Transwick brother, Dawson, had read it aloud to him, when he wasn't too busy laughing at the penmanship. Devon Transwick was very capable of writing a letter, but it was impossible to imagine him writing one to his former servant. Connor could still remember the open hatred in Devon's gaze as Tariq led Connor away from the crowd during their nectar ceremony, which was why Connor was surprised to see what looked like Devon's handwriting. It was a little more jiggly and uneven, but the capital letters looked the same. Letter from home? asked the pillow cook, somehow figuring out from his hopeless expression that he couldn't read it. She added kindly, Shall I read it to you? Yes, thank you. Wiping her hands on her apron, the cook took the letter and scanned to the bottom. It's from your mother! Connor's heart soared for just a moment before crashing back to the earth. It couldn't be true. Connor's mother couldn't read or write. Dear Connor, I have wanted to send you a letter for a long time, but as you know, I could not write. Devon Trunswick's little brother, Dawson, has kindly agreed to write it for me. He says he needs the practice with his handwriting anyway. He is a fine boy. I do not have much time before my evening duties, but I wanted to let you know that we are proud of you. Sadly, things have gotten worse since you left. I have had to take your place as Devon's servant, as our debt to Lord Trunswick was still large when you left. Also, a very cold spring killed many of our lambs, and the wolves have been getting desperate. We lost two of our dogs to them this season. Food is scarce. We must hand over almost everything we earn to the Trunswicks to pay our debt. 
I do not mean to scare you, but it is hard to make ends meet without your labor. Please ask the green cloaks if they could send food for us this winter. Surely it is the least they can do for us, as you work with them now. I would not ask if it was not dire. With all of my love, your mother. P.S. This is Dawson. I am sorry that your family is so hungry. My father will not forgive their debt. I asked him. Connor didn't say anything. It was bad enough to imagine his mother as Devin's servant, but also to imagine his family starving. He didn't want to picture it, but he couldn't help seeing disaster striking. They had been close enough to it when his father had asked him to go work for Devin. Even as he'd hated leaving for Transwick, even as he'd wondered why he was the sibling who had to go, he'd known that otherwise they would have starved. Suddenly, the bag of food he'd packed felt like a luxury. I'm sure they'll be all right, said the pillow cook, draping her arm over Connor's shoulders and giving him back the letter. Giving you up to Brigan is just their sacrifice to save Erdos. You heard what she said. She's proud of you. One of the other cooks handed Connor his bag. As are we, she added. Now off with you. Brigan's lad doesn't belong in a kitchen, no matter where he came from. But if I don't belong in a field or kitchen anymore, Connor thought, and I don't feel like I belong in a castle, then where do I belong? Chapter 4 Moon Tower on the other side of the fortress, Mei Lin paced in the map room. As she moved around the room, her hands behind her back, she did her absolute best to avoid looking at the 300-pound panda in the room with her. It wasn't that she didn't like G. It was just that looking at her reminded Mei Lin of precisely everything that was angering her at the moment. In front of Mei Lin was a map of Erdas, all the continents were neatly drawn in burgundy ink. Amaya, Nilo, Yura, and Zhong. Someone had lightly drawn in another continent, Stetriol, near the bottom of the map. Melin put her finger on it. This was where the conquerors were coming from, where the devourer was coming from. Melin traced her finger to Zhong. It wasn't very far at all. No wonder Zhang was the first to be attacked. Is my father still alive? She wondered. If she closed her eyes, she could still see the general's face. Meilin dragged her finger from Zhang to Yura. It seemed like a much farther distance than Stetriol to Zhang. Why am I here? She thought furiously. Why am I not there, fighting? And why do I have such a useless spirit animal? She wished the others were ready to go. Meilin had selected her weapons and supplies and packed with the efficiency her father had taught her. She wasn't surprised that the others were slower. They probably weren't used to having enough belongings to even learn how to pack. It felt a little better to be going on a mission, but doubt chewed at her. How was chasing down the other great beasts supposed to do anything to help Zhang now? Meilin spun. G sat silently behind her. The black spots around her eyes made her look a little sad. She was so slow, so peaceful. Sure, she had some healing powers, but not enough to save someone mortally wounded. G would be a very useful ally if the devourer needed to be cuddled to death. Fury bubbled in Meilin. The door opened. Immediately, Mei Ling composed her face. She wouldn't let anyone see her truly upset, especially not if it was Rolan. And it was Rolan, along with Connor, Abeka, and Finn. They seemed in high spirits, apart from Finn, whose youthful face was as masked as Mei Lin's. In the lamps of the map room, his grey hair looked nearly white. It's a little late to be studying up on geography, Rolan said to Mei Lin. Essex sailed in behind him, tucking her wings to keep from singeing them on the torches. I was bored, she replied stiffly. 
I finished packing hours ago. Let me guess, Roland said. You took a class in it. Four tutors taught you how to fold your clothing. For the record, I travelled a lot with my father. I taught myself. Maylin turned to Finn. Tell me again why our mission is so important. Quietly, Finn explained. If we truly can find Rumphus the boar, we might be able to persuade him to give up his talisman. I understand you four retrieved one from Arax the ram. The devourer seeks these talismans to use them in the war, and we must beat him to them. If, Malin echoed, if we find the boar, if we persuade him to give us the talisman, what if we don't? Finn gave her a very long look. I don't think we should bank on failure so early, do you? Suddenly, Tariq flew into the room, cloak swirling, face grim. I'm sorry to be late, but I have very bad news. Malin's stomach lurched. She felt like Tariq was looking at her in particular. Father. Sure enough, Tariq's eyes held hers a moment longer. He said, Jean has fallen to the conquerors. No, she whispered. I'm afraid so, Tariq said. The capital city has been taken over, and Maylin, your father is missing. Maylin folded her arms to hide their shaking. She wanted to cry, but she wouldn't let herself do so in front of the others, all of whom were trying very hard to look at anything but her. Instead, as devastation burned behind her eyes, she shouted, I should never have come here! There's absolutely no point to having me along on a, a treasure hunt across the globe. I should have been fighting by his side. She shot a poisonous look at G. And you! The panda met Malin's glare with her own gentle gaze, cutting the girl short. G's presence was a painful reminder of home. All Malin could think of was the colourful roofs of Jano Rion burning. Zhong fallen. Her father missing. Maylin, started Tariq. I know that this is terrible news, but finding Rumphus is really the most helpful step you can take right now. I don't believe that, she snapped. She thought she could feel some sort of emotion coming off G, but she pushed it away. There's no guarantee that we'll find him, and there's no guarantee that he'll give us the talisman, and even if he does, there are more than a dozen left to go. Zhong needs me now. You're only one girl, Tariq said. Here, you're part of a team. Melin's cold gaze flitted across Connor, Rolan, Abeka, and Finn. The servant, the orphan, the traitor, and the warrior who had given up war. Not much of a team, she thought. You cannot force me, she said. I'm going back to Zhong. You can't, Connor said, an unbearable concern in his voice. Watch me, Malin shot back. Connor stuttered, B but we need you. Zhong needs me. Turning to G, she added, you can stay here. Storming from the room, she slammed the door behind her. She hurried down the hall so fast that the flaming lamps flickered as she passed. She hoped no one tried to come after her. All she wanted was to get her bag and a horse and go. She'd follow the main trade road back to Jean. She was nearly back to her room when a hand caught her arm. Maylin. She spun. It was Finn. She didn't know how he caught up to her so silently. Maylin's expression darkened. Trundling behind him was G. Slower, of course. Not much louder, though. You can't keep me here, she said. Finn tossed her arm away, almost contemptuously, so she could see how he never intended to physically contain her. In a way, it made her feel better that he wasn't trying to spare her feelings, like Tariq or Olven might have. She didn't want to be coddled. He said, I left a place once in anger. Leaving in anger means returning in regret. I don't want that for you. I'm not returning, Malin thought, so the regret won't matter. 
but something about the way he spoke, calm and measured, reminded her a little of her father. So she said, I'm listening. You did your spirit animal a bad turn back there, Finn continued. Has she ever done the same to you? Glancing at G out of the corner of her eye, Maylin felt a little stab of guilt, but not enough guilt to change her mind. Out loud, she said, No, she does practically nothing. The bond was wrong. I'm sure she'd be happier with a different girl. Actually, Maylin thought that G would have been perfect for the girl everyone back in Zhong had thought she was. Very few had known about her combat lessons or her interest in strategy. Most saw only the carefully made-up girl who looked so pretty as she strolled in the tea garden or handled the cocoons for silk-making. G would have looked right at home with that public Maylin. I don't know if you're so different, Finn said. Will you come with me? I'll show you something. If it doesn't interest you, you can leave, and I won't be the one to stop you. Maylin reluctantly followed him to a foyer with an iron chandelier and then through an arched doorway. The room inside was cluttered with dusty mirrors, musical instruments, and objects Maylin saw no use for. It reminded her of all the useless weapons at the morning's training exercise. This room was piled with things that would serve as shoddy weapons. The mess of it irritated her. What was the purpose, she wondered, of a room full of disorganized junk. Even if there was something useful in here, no one would be able to find it. What is this place? This is the Moon Tower, Finn said. It's a place where green cloaks can form deeper bonds with their spirit animals. My bond is fine, Maylin replied crisply. Chi sat down heavily beside a dusty gong. She would go into passive form on the first day. Roland is still struggling. Finn raised his eyebrows. I wouldn't compare myself with Roland. We are our own competition. Shocked, she said. My father said that very same thing to me. Well then, Finn said with a ghost of a smile. He must be very wise. No, this tower isn't for training. It's more like play or meditation. Sometimes music, art, or logic games will encourage a stronger bond and reveal hidden skills. Malin sighed in frustration. I know her skills, but she's nothing like me. Finn's expression sharpened. You do everyone a disservice when you forget who you really are. Is combat all there is to you? She opened her mouth and then closed it. The question was maddening in its silliness. Of course not, but my home has already been taken. It's what Zhong, what my father, needs of me at the moment. And at the end of all this? Maylin raised her hands in a helpless gesture. We'll see about that once we get there, if we get there. Take my word on it, that might be too late. Balance, Maylin. Surely your father told you that. Look at this. He pulled up his sleeve, looking for one tattoo among the tangle of tattoos. Finally, he pressed his finger to a symbol, inked between a tangled thorn tree and a collection of pictograms. It was a circle, divided in half with a wavy line. One half was light, the other half was dark. Meilin was again shocked. That's a Zhongyi symbol. How do you know it? I was one of the Green Cloak's greatest warriors. I have been all over Erdos in my time. So you know this symbol? Of course she did. One side is light, one side is dark. One side is active, the other passive, day and night. Opposites, Finn said, but both part of the same whole. Maylin worked hard to quell her indignation. She was getting tired of green cloaks telling her she needed to make more of an effort to bond, as if she hadn't been trying. How does that do me any good? 
Finn gestured to the things around them. This is a place to find out. When she still looked unconvinced, he said, I'm using this room myself. Would you like to hear the story? She merely raised an eyebrow in response. He began, My final battle was near Zhong, in Oceanus. My brothers and I were ambushing a small band of the Devourer's allies. There were fifty of them, and only five of us, but we had fought worse odds with our spirit animals. Five marked siblings in one family, yes, he said in response to Maylin's puzzled look. The green cloaks told us we were chosen. I was supposed to accomplish so many great things. Finn said this last part with a bitter smile that gave Maylin a stab of anxiety. The green cloaks were saying the same thing about her. I was known to be clever with the making of things, so my brothers asked me to build a trap. It was a cunning one, a great pit with young trees bent this way and that over it. Over the top of their flexible trunks, I'd woven in brush with the roots still hanging so the plants would stay green. When I was done, it looked just like a grassy bank, just another hill to climb. It was strong enough to support one man, but the trees would give way under the weight of more than one. Then all we'd have to do is wave at the enemy from up above after they'd all fallen through. Half of the conquerors were meant to fall in it before the other half even knew what was going on. But then something went terribly wrong. They discovered the trap, or rather, their spirit animals did. Somehow, all fifty of them had bonded with spirit animals. That's impossible, but they had. So it was not only fifty conquerors, but fifty conquerors aided by fifty spirit animals. Maylin made a soft noise of disbelief. Bonding with spirit animals was so rare that it was hard to imagine fifty marked individuals in one place outside of the green cloaks. But Finn's face was serious. You doubt it. I doubted it myself. Like I said, impossible. But you're also impossible. No one can summon a great beast, and yet the four of you have. It seems we have entered impossible times. Maylin inclined her head. True enough. Finn continued. The spirit animals discovered the trap easily, making it useless. There's nothing dangerous about a hole no one falls into. My brothers and I tried to hold them off, but it was no use. There were too many of them. Imagine if you can, Maylin, fifty spirit animals. Animals we'd never seen before. Rhinos, cougars, anacondas, scorpions. My brothers were slaughtered. It was, I barely. My youngest brother, Alec, distracted them so I could get away. Recovering has been difficult. It was horrific. Not just for me, but for my spirit animal, Don. I nearly lost him. During the battle, he entered the passive state, and now he will not come back out. Maylin's eyes were wide. Your brothers? That's terrible. And your spirit animal? I didn't know that could happen. Finn looked around the moon tower. My spirit animal, Don and I, had a very difficult bonding. I lived in a very remote village, and the nectar didn't make it in time. I was the only child of age, and the green cloaks found me too late. The moon tower helped us to find a measure of peace. I know it will help us again. Malin said, I want to ask a question, but it might be rude. Finn smiled a tiny smile. I won't be offended. There's not much that can hurt me in this world anymore. Was your hair always that colour? Now Finn smiled ruefully as he patted the crazy grey-white spikes. No, it changed after the battle. 
I woke up and my hair had gone completely white. Now, will you try to connect with G here in the moon tower? Slowly, Maylin nodded. She didn't think it could really change her mind, but after his terrible confession, she felt she owed it to him to try. What's the right way to do this? She asked. It's play, Finn said. There is no right way. Maylin had never been a playful child. There had always been combat to train for, languages to learn, skills to conquer. There might have been time for play, but she hadn't been interested. Play had never changed the world. She took another look around the room. Before, she had found it disordered and useless. But with deeper examination, she saw a kind of organization. Drums gathered near paintings that had to do with earth and objects made of leather and wood. String instruments were near metal sculptures and mirrors and paintings of water. Woodwinds, paper objects, and anything having to do with air seemed to be grouped together. Somehow this made her trust the room's purpose more. She had been educated in the usefulness of the arts. She would never be convinced there was a purpose for chaos. Her eyes landed on an air who, a traditional instrument from Zhang. She had received hours of lessons, but it had been months since she'd played. Taking up the bow, she crossed back to Ji. Standing this close, Meilin could feel the heat radiating from the panda's body and smell the wet bamboo scent of her coarse fur. Ji rolled her gaze toward Meilin. I'm trying, Meilin said. I'll try if you try. Feeling a little foolish, she began to play. At first, she could only remember her instructor correcting her finger position and her bow technique. But after a few measures, she began to feel something else. A wide open peace. Meilin knew that the emotion was coming from G. This was part of the panda's power. Ordinarily, this was where Mei Lin lost patience. She had no interest in being calm. But she had promised Ji she would try. Slowly, the peace focused. A very strange thing happened then. Mei Lin imagined she was surrounded by small, floating planets. Tinier moons circled some of them. She knew in a fuzzy, dreamy way that these orbs were her options. As the Urhu sang sweetly in the background, Melin realized that the closest little sphere represented the path back to Zhong. It was certainly the closest option, but it was also the smallest, and there were no other moon choices floating around it. With her decisions hovering outside of her mind, it was easy to tell that her plan to return to Zhong was logical, but reactive. And it was easy to see, too, that it left her with nowhere else to go. Ji's power kept pushing at Meilin. She glimpsed the orb that represented the choice of going in search of Rumphus. It was a troubled, stormy planet, but it was surrounded by more choices, and each of those was surrounded by even more. It wouldn't be an easy choice, but it had more possibilities close by. Maylin strained her neck to see it closer. Suddenly, in one of the orbs, she saw her father's proud face. You've made the wise decision, he said, instead of the smart one. Well done. Maylin stopped playing all at once. The mysterious orbs vanished. Gee blinked quietly at her. What happened? Finn asked. Maylin had forgotten he was there. Maylin didn't know how to explain it. The panda had helped her to think. I made a decision, she said. I'm going with you. Chapter 5 Journey It started to rain. It rained as they fetched horses from the stables. 
It rained as they left Greenhaven Castle. It rained while they loaded supplies onto the boat to Eura. It rained as the ship shoved off from the pier and into the storm grey water. It rained on everyone, but it especially rained on Roland. He didn't get along with boats, so he stood at the railing and tried not to focus on his churning insides. He could bear being drizzled on if it meant he didn't throw up on anyone. Essex found a perch on one of the masts, looking a little unsettled herself. Stuffing her head under her wing, she quivered sickly. It was strangely quiet. He could hear the rain falling on the ocean. Although the ship had sails, they were tied tightly away on the masts. He couldn't quite work out what propelled the ship. Far up ahead, though, he saw two odd waves breaking again and again. Water pushed by the ship's hull, maybe? It didn't seem very likely. Wales! Abeka's clipped voice startled him as she joined him. The rain dribbling down her nose matched the rain dribbling down Roland's. Uraza sauntered behind her, ears pinned in the damp, tail thrashing. Wales what? Abeka pointed. Rockback Wales, they're pulling the ship. She indicated the odd waves. Now that Roland focused on them, he could tell that they were indeed whales, not water. The beasts were as mottled grey and black as the stormy sea, and their spines were studded with stones and boulders, like moving cliffs just beneath the water. They must have been longer than the ship itself. Roland was deeply impressed, but would have never admitted it out loud. He asked, How did you know? She didn't seem as if she wanted to answer, but she pressed her lips together and replied, when I accompanied the conquerors to look for the first talisman, we travelled in a ship like this. I'd never seen anything like it. There's not much opportunity to travel by ship in Nilo, much less a rock-back whale ferry. For a few minutes, they both watched the rocky backs rise and fall. In the eerie hush, one of the whales called to the other. It was a hollow, echoey sound that seemed both very close and very far. Wow, a beggar breathed. Creepy, Roland corrected. Speaking of creepy, let's talk about those conquerors. It wasn't the most tactful way to bring it up, but Roland wasn't really known for his tact. A beggar raised an eyebrow but said nothing. It was hard to say if she was hurt by his words or hiding something. Roland glanced toward the mast where Essex perched, her head still beneath her wing. Her intuitive power would have come in handy right about now, but she showed no signs of helping out. Well, you were fighting for them and all, Roland said. I figured you might have the inside track on all things Conqueror. I already told you how it happened, Rebecca replied stiffly. Tell me again, I love happy endings. She sighed. Roland, don't you remember what it was like when you called up Essex? Was she what you expected? Of course she hadn't been expected. Roland hadn't been expecting much of anything, as he had been sitting in a prison at the time. And in prison, disappointment was generally the most practical thing to expect. And even if he hadn't been incarcerated, he couldn't have expected Essex to appear. Nobody called up great beasts. Sure, Roland replied easily. Miracles happen to me all the time. Rebecca made a face. She touched the tuft of coarse fur at Uraza's shoulders, as if for comfort. Don't you remember how uncertain everything was? Nobody knows if they are going to call up a spirit animal at all. And the rituals make it so nerve-wracking. Everyone is looking at you. There's so much pressure. I didn't have a ritual, Roland said. I had a homeless guy and a rat, but I get the idea. Abeka stopped. Do you want to talk about it? No, actually, I don't. That's basically the beginning, middle, and end of it anyway. Homeless guy, rat, magical falcon, happy ending. Told you, I love those things. Go on with your story. She said, My ritual was very well attended. 
We desperately needed rain, and there was hope that a new rain dancer would be named. Then, all of a sudden, I had a spirit animal, and it was a great beast, and then it began to rain. My father had never looked at me like that before. My sister had never looked at me that way before. No one had. Everyone thought I was the new rain dancer. I was still trying to understand that I'd summoned a spirit animal. And then, in the middle of the commotion, Zarif appeared and told me that he needed me to help save the world. Maybe you would have done better, Rolan, but during all that, I really didn't think to ask him, are you telling the truth? Rolan thought back to his own summoning. Zarif had appeared not long after Essex had. But Rolan had doubted him, and then taken off running. To be fair, that was how Rolan approached most situations in life. He'd pulled the same stunt for the green cloaks too, doubt and run. Never a bad plan. Abeka broke in ruefully. You did ask him, didn't you? Or at least, you didn't trust him. When he looked at her, surprised, she added, I could tell by your face, you were thinking I was foolish to go with him. A fool's better than a traitor. Very serious, she nodded. Roland, I want you to know that I won't let the green cloaks down. I'm not a green cloak, he thought, but he didn't say it out loud. Instead, he watched Uraza slink damply after Rebecca as they retreated to the ship's cabin. After they had gone, Essex flapped down to join him, her talons tight on the wet wood. Thanks for your help back there, he told her. What do you think about her? Essex stretched out a leg and chewed on one of her talons. That, Roland said, is exactly how I feel about it. It kept pouring. Once they made landfall, they transferred the supplies to the horses and set off through the damp evening. Technically, the horses were supposed to be a privilege, a way to make the long journey faster and more agreeable. But practically, Roland wished they were walking. Neither he nor Essex got along with his horse. For starters, Roland wasn't the best of riders. Life as a street urchin hadn't exactly prepared him for hours in the saddle. Back in Concorba, if he'd wanted to go somewhere, he'd gone on the bottoms of his own two feet. It was only because of their last mission that he'd had any experience on horseback at all. In fact, after that ride across a mire, he still had blisters in all kinds of places where blisters shouldn't be. Also, his horse was a terrible animal. Terrible to look at, with its flecked grey coat, and terrible to be around, with its habit of biting Roland. If he relaxed his hold on the reins at all, the creature would bend itself almost in half to nip at his legs. It hated Essex too. If the falcon got anywhere near, the horse would rear and snap toward the bird. Maybe it's hungry, Connor suggested as they rode side by side through the drizzle. Hungry for human flesh, maybe, Roland replied. Overhead, Essex cried out, the horse pinned its ears back angrily. Falcon flesh too. If you treat him with respect, he'll treat you with respect, Tariq called. Easy for him, I say, Roland thought, as Tariq and Maylin began a conversation about the pleasures of being taught horseback riding before one could walk. After a few hours, Roland was wet to the skin. His scruffy hair stuck to his forehead, the rolling, treeless countryside was already soaked green and black. Even if they'd wanted to stop, there was no shelter. Oh yeah, he said, this reminds me of home. He'd spent countless evenings on the streets, pressed against a wall barely out of the rain. Stomach growling, always hungry. Well, at least now his stomach was full. Too tough for you? Melin asked sweetly. Her black hair was slicked on either side of her face. Oh no, Roland replied. I'm great at being cold and wet, one of my finest skills. Maylin shot back. Did you have tutors for that? I taught myself. She smiled at that, then hid it fast. But Roland had already seen. Ha, score one point for me. 
He was a little worried at how much he was getting used to not living on the streets, actually. He still hadn't made up his mind over whether or not he wanted to work with the green cloaks permanently. But if he left now, he'd have to get used to being hungry and dirty and mostly dead all over again. Just a few weeks ago, all he'd cared about was whether or not he'd get to eat once every three days. Now he had stopped worrying about meals and was instead concentrating on getting a smile out of a snotty general's daughter. Slippery slope, Roland, he reminded himself. Don't forget how to be on your own. It will be better once we get in the trees, Tariq said, gesturing to a small copse of oaks ahead. We'll need to be on our guard, Finn spoke up, the first thing he had said since they mounted the horses. Yura is not as safe as it once was. You all should remember the lessons you learned in training before we left. The main lesson Roland had learned in training was that Maylin was dangerous with a handkerchief. Taking advantage of his distraction, Roland's horse stopped in its tracks and tried to take a bite out of his leg. No way, he told it, jerking the opposite rein. That's my favorite leg. From down the road, Tariq said, Your horse used to be a spirit animal. His human fell in battle. That's why he's so irritable. Roland worked to save his favorite leg, and then the other one. Pretty shoddy reason. Abeka said thoughtfully, I hear it's unbearable if the bond is broken. It's true, Tariq said. As you four know, the bond is a powerful thing, and it gets stronger the longer you're together. To lose your bonded partner is like losing a limb. Roland's horse made another grab at him. Yellow teeth snagged fabric and narrowly missed bone. I'm right on track to know what that feels like, he muttered. Do you think the horse is jealous of Roland and Essex's bond? Abeka asked. There was not a lot to be jealous of. Essex would come to Roland in a pinch, but they both seemed to be loners. Roland couldn't figure out a way to get through to the falcon, or even if he really wanted to. He'd gotten along fine before she came along, and he figured he could probably manage fine after, too. He guessed she felt the same way about him. Tariq lifted a shoulder. Possibly, or it could just remind him of what he once had. Roland twisted to look at Abeka. Her bond with Uraza seemed pretty great. The leopard followed her as if the two of them were thinking the same thoughts, wanting the same things. With Essex, Roland felt they wanted the same thing about as often as any bird and boy would, which wasn't much at all. Tariq's horse spooked, hooves stamping and scraping on the ground. Roland couldn't immediately see what had startled it. Then he glimpsed a small furry animal scrabbling up the horse's side. Tariq swiped at it with a surprised horse laugh. He called out, It's a weasel! Roland curled his lip. He hated weasels more than his horse. They were like rats, but longer. Like snakes, but furrier. What's going on up there? Finn asked from his position at the rear. I've got it under control, Tariq called back, swatting at the biting and clawing animal. It looked like he was being attacked by a scarf. Behind him, Connor and Abeka clearly couldn't decide if they were allowed to laugh. The weasel lunged for Tariq's eyes. Tariq blocked the animal, barely. His horse reared again. Suddenly, a surge of intuition jolted through Roland, certain and overpowering and ferocious. His eyes found Essex in the sky without having to search for her. The falcon's gaze was fixed on him as well. This was one thing they had in common, an uncanny ability to read people and situations. And when they worked together, the connection was, well, it was easy to see why Essex was called a great beast. Now Roland knew the truth as clear as if someone had shouted it to him. Something was wrong. This was an ambush. Watch out, he shouted. It's a trap. Finn scanned the woods, his expression sharpening. Conquerors, arm yourselves. Two men plunged out of the brush, a fox on their heels. In a decisive move, one seized the bridle of Finn's horse, and the other threw himself at Tariq. 
Lumio, Tariq's spirit animal, an otter, twisted suddenly out of his dormant form. A third man charged from the trees, a badger on his heels. Roland's stomach dropped. These new animals were no ordinary animals. They were spirit animals. Conqueror's spirit animals. Don't just stand there, Malin ordered, voice clear and ringing. Attack! Roland realized he had been frozen by the chaos. Up ahead, Tariq jumped off his horse and drew a knife against his human attacker, even as the weasel dug its teeth into his shoulder. The conqueror easily avoided Tariq's knife. The bond between him and the weasel was giving the man superhuman agility. More conquerors emerged, too many to count. Everything was a mess of people and spirit animals. So many spirit animals. Roland kicked his horse to get closer to the fray. The action promptly caused the horse to swing its head to snap at him. No, he said furiously. You grass-burning chump! Look, they're in trouble! Go that way! The horse bucked. Roland clutched its neck to keep from flying off. Brigand loped by him, Connor close to his heels, dagger in hand. A becker was right behind, wielding a large tree branch like a weapon, as Uraza pounced. They all looked gloriously useful. Overhead, Essex cried out. In Falcon language, it clearly meant, do something. I'm trying, Roland said. Where's your sense of loyalty, horse? The horse reared. This time, Roland slid right off the back of his rain-slick saddle. Both his pride and his tailbone shouted angrily as he landed. The horse was gone faster than you could say traitor. He clambered to his feet. Essex swooped low to see if he was okay. At least somebody is loyal around here, he thought. He gave her a thumbs up. He didn't know if she understood. Falcons didn't have thumbs. Two other conquerors were closing in on Tariq. One of them was bald and had a snake wrapped loosely around his arm. The other was dramatically moustached and had a small cat at his feet. As Tariq parried their blows with astonishing precision, Lumio pounced on the cat in a chaos of fur and tooth. The cat's conqueror was momentarily distracted, and Tariq took advantage of this, delivering a roundhouse blow to his foe's midsection. The conqueror stumbled back into Tariq's horse, who delivered a kick of its own, knocking the attacker unconscious. The cat fled to the woods. Connor and Brigan were holding off the conqueror, who'd been joined by the badger. The man seemed to weaken as soon as Brigan got the badger clamped in his jaw. Finn stood in the shadows, head bowed, holding his side tightly. He seemed to be fighting a battle that existed behind his own closed eyes. The conquerors hadn't noticed him yet. Close by, Maylin had been drawn farther away to fight with two other conquerors. When Abeka approached with her tree branch to give aid, Maylin shouted to her, I don't need your help. Abeka looked shocked, but she wasn't deterred. She leaped to rescue Finn as a conqueror discovered him. It wasn't ideal, but Maylin, Abeka, and Finn looked like they were handling themselves. Tariq, on the other hand, he faced not only the persistent weasel, but also the bald conqueror with the snake wrapped around his arm. Roland ran toward him. The weasel scrambled up Tariq's face. In that moment, the bald conqueror tossed the serpent. Blinded by the weasel, Tariq didn't immediately understand this new threat. Tariq, Roland shouted, it's the snake! The green cloak's hands tightened around the serpent. Too late, the snake's fangs sank into his arm. Tariq shook off the weasel and ripped the snake from himself, but he staggered. In this moment of vulnerability, the bald conqueror raised his sword, about to deliver a killing blow. There wasn't enough time for Roland to reach him before the sword fell. Essex, he yelled. Surely she would come through for him when it was really important. The falcon dove, claws outstretched. She landed on the enemy's bald head a moment before he swung the sword. As the conqueror flailed, nothing but feathers in his view, Roland scrambled to seize the man's sword. Get it off of me, the man screamed. His eyes were shut tight, 
Essex's talons were inches away from them. Relang clutched the sword threateningly. If I do, will you leave us alone? Anything, the man said. Trust me. Out of the corner of his eye, Roland glimpsed the snake slither into the bald conqueror's open hand. Unfortunately for you, said Roland, I don't trust anyone. The conqueror threw the serpent forward, but Roland was ready. He swung the sword. The heavy blade sliced the snake neatly in two and kept on swinging, right into the conqueror's leg. Both Roland and the bald man howled, the conqueror in pain, Roland in surprise. It was the first time Roland had ever struck a human with a proper sword, and unbelievably, no one had been around to notice it. Well, except Essex, Roland thought, as the falcon flapped into the air with a dry, approving cry. He gave the falcon a hasty one-finger salute as he spun to deal with the remaining spirit animal. The weasel, however, had slunk into the trees. It must have been looking for its human partner. The conqueror continued wailing. Don't move a muscle, Roland warned, sword still pointed at him. You try to slither your way out of this one, you might lose something precious to you, like your life. A cry pierced the air from where Connor had been fighting his foe. Without removing the sword's tip from his prisoner, Roland glanced toward the commotion. Brigan held a conqueror's spirit animal in his jaws, the badger Roland had seen earlier. The conqueror watched anxiously from the edge of the woods. With a growl, the wolf opened his jaws. The badger fell lifeless to the ground. The conqueror threw up his arm, trying to call the badger back to him. Nothing happened. He tried again. Still nothing. No tattoo would form. The man let out an anguished cry. No one moved against him as he shifted to claim the badger. Without even a glance for the others, he disappeared with it into the forest. Connor did not follow. There was a curious sadness in his face. Roland was unsympathetic. The conqueror should have known. Don't bring a badger to a great beast fight. Roland turned his attention to Tariq, whose clothing was tattered and bloodstained. It looks worse than it is, Tariq muttered, teeth clenched in pain. That snake, Roland began. A urine adder. I need to get the herbal antidote for the venom. Unfortunately, it will only get worse. This sounded alarming to Roland. Have you been bit before? Tariq answered calmly. No, but I have seen others. Can you walk? The green cloak winced. Is my horse gone? Nearby, Connor nodded grimly. Gone. In fact, aside from the conqueror's groans, which Roland thought were uncalled for, the forest had fallen uneasily silent. Roland called out for Maylin, Abeka, and Finn. There was no reply. Where'd they go? He asked Connor. Connor pointed. The others galloped that way, but we'd never catch up. Our horses are gone. Even Tariq's well-behaved steed had vanished, spooked by the combat. Well, this is a grand adventure, remarked Rolan. Three missing and one chewed on. What do we do now? With a grimace, Tariq pushed himself onto an elbow. In a low voice, so that the conqueror couldn't hear, he whispered, There's a green cloak near here, an old informant. I think that's the best place to go. Finn knows her and she will have the antidote. I'm afraid you'll have to help me walk, though. Connor and Roland each took one of Tariq's arms and hauled him up. Lumio stood by his side, his coat uneven and sodden from the fight in the damp underbrush. His normally playful expression was keen, trying to anticipate what Tariq might need from him. It's all right, old friend, Tariq said to his spirit animal. He was shivering in an alarming sort of way. Don't worry. Do you think the others are okay? Connor asked. You said Finn was just a scout. He doesn't fight, does he? But Maylin does, Tariq said. Very well, as we keep finding out. And Finn still has his wits. I'm optimistic. But we'd better get going. 
It's not far, but with me like this, it will probably feel that way. Tariq tried to be valiant, but it was clear that his condition was darkening with the evening. By the time night had fallen, he was quivering and clammy. Roland wondered just how fast this antidote would work. Finally, Tariq breathed. There, there it is. Conray exclaimed, that's a castle. Roland squinted at the single tower, grey and ghostly in the rainy dark. There was only one very short door and no discernible window openings. It looked like the sort of building an unimaginative child would build. If it's a castle, where's the rest of it? Beggars can't be choosers, Tariq said. Help me down the path. At the small door, he did a complicated knock. Nothing happened. He did it again. He told them, sometimes she pretends to be deaf. The door opened. An old woman, tiny and as wizened as an ancient fruit tree, stood on the other side. She said, I am deaf. Roland and Connor exchanged a look behind Tariq's head. Tariq, croaked the old woman. She had a voice like wood shavings. A faded green cloak hung on a peg just beside the door, but it looked as if it hadn't been moved for quite a while. It's been a long time. Tariq, corrected Tariq. That's what I said, she replied. There seems to be less of you than the last time I saw you. A snake and a weasel ate the rest, Roland said. A urine adder, to be precise. I'm not sure what kind of weasel. The old woman noticed Connor and Roland for the first time. And two new green cloaks, I see. Really, her voice sounded more like someone eating pebbles. One, corrected Roland, by which I mean not me. Lady Evelyn, Tariq said faintly, these are the ones you must have heard about, the children who summoned the fallen beasts. The lady eyeballed them closely. It was not an entirely comfortable experience. She had a little bit of a moustache, just a few white hairs. Roland tried not to stare. Oh no, Tarine, you must be mistaken, she crackled. There are four of those children. This is certainly only two. Tariq, he corrected again. There was a scuffle on the road. We have lost touch with the other two for the moment. You lost half of the fallen? That seems careless, the old woman, Lady Evelyn, said. Now her voice was more like stepping on a very large beetle. Well, come in before you lose another half. Inside the tower was the opposite of the grand Greenhaven castle. Straw covered the floor. Threadbare tapestries hung over the narrow window slits to keep the wind out. Something thin and grey boiled in a pot hanging over the fire. Circular stairs led up to nowhere. Roland could see clear up into the blackness that must be the top of the tower. Essex had already soared up there to explore. I know what you're thinking, not a green cloak, Lady Evelyn said. She was already puttering around in a collection of glass bottles and dried herbs, fingers searching across the cluttered windowsill. Not a very pretty castle, that's what you're thinking. It wasn't meant to be pretty. It was just a place to keep cattle after you stole them. Who steals cattle? Connor asked. She cackled. Who doesn't? Me, he said. Turning, she sniffed him. <laughs> ah, you're a shepherd's son, though. You're a guardian, not a thief. Connor, surprised at her intuition, sniffed his wet sleeve, as if he possibly still smelled like his old life. A soft wicker interrupted them. Ah, said Lady Evelyn. This is my spirit animal, Dot. Roland grimaced, another horse. Dot was a sway-backed, black-and-white miniature horse the size of a dog. She also had a bit of a moustache, just a few white hairs. He whispered to Connor, It's the opposite of a great beast. Lady Evelyn chose that moment to be deaf.
she instead knocked several plates and scrolls off the table and said, Why don't you lay Tarbin down here so I can get to mending him? You boys can dry off by the fire and help yourselves to dinner. The boys hesitantly stripped off their cloaks to dry by the fireplace and peered into the bubbling cauldron. Every now and then, something white and shapeless would boil up to the surface and then descend into the grey liquid again. Connor whispered, I don't know if that's food or laundry. Roland's stomach growled. It didn't care. I ate my fair share of laundry on the fine streets of Concorba. Connor poked it with a ladle. He scooped something brown and stringy from the bottom. Food, Roland declared. Laundry is never stringy. Connor didn't seem eager to sample it. Apparently Shepherd's sons had more refined palates than street urchins. Roland tried the stew, or whatever it was. It tasted like a puddle in the bad part of town. How is it? Connor asked. Delicious. Connor looked over to where Lady Evelyn was ministering to Tariq. Do you think he'll be okay? He asked. Roland didn't want to lie, so he answered, I don't know. They ate in silence for a short time. Tariq was not entirely successful in stifling his pain. Eventually, he quieted too. Neither Roland nor Connor was sure of what this meant. Green cloak boy, Lady Evelyn ordered from behind them. And not a green cloak boy. I need to talk to you about your quest. They joined her at the table. Tariq is fine now, she told them in a low voice. I gave him something to help him sleep. He will recover, but it will take some time. He is lucky the serpent didn't strike closer to his heart. As it is, the venom will be hard to counteract. He will need constant rest and even more constant attention. Luckily, I never rest and am constantly attentive. However, he won't be able to travel with you. What? Connor cried. Both he and Roland peered at Tariq, though their mentor's face was more peaceful now. His skin looked strange and slack, and his lips were oddly parched. His breath came unevenly, and his fingers still shook with the tremors Roland had felt on the journey here. It was obvious he'd used the very last of his strength bringing them all here. Roland struggled with how to feel. Since he wasn't a green cloak, he technically didn't owe Tariq any allegiance. But still, Tariq had trained him and protected him. He'd never been anything but kind to Roland, even if Roland wasn't sure if that was only because of Essex. It was difficult to see him like this, utterly vulnerable, so close to death. He tells me another elder green cloak, Fon, Finn, Fan, should find his way here with the remaining fallen. If they don't get here by morning, though, you need to set off alone. Alone? echoed Connor, dismayed. Time is of the essence. The green cloaks are not the only ones who seek rumpus. But we don't know where to go, protested Connor. A gaping chasm of uncertainty opened in Roland's stomach, and it only grew wider and blacker the more he considered. They had just barely survived an encounter with a few conquerors. Tariq had been doing this a lot longer than either Roland or Connor, and now he was flat on a table being fed gruel. The last time the boys had faced off against a great beast, they'd had the help of adults. Even if by some crazy stroke of luck they managed to meet back up with Finn, the other green cloak didn't fight, which meant that the plan on offer right now involved Roland and Connor heading into the wilderness and then taking on Rumpus on their own. I have a map, Lady Evelyn said. When neither of them looked excited by this confession, she added, Do you children know what a map is? Roland and Connor exchanged another dismal look. Lady Evelyn spread a map over Tariq's sleeping chest. She pointed to a town near the top. This is Glen Gavin. The rumour says that Rumpus is near here. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, 
That's far north, and up there they paint their faces blue and eat foreigners. That hadn't been what Roland or Connor was thinking, but it sure was what they were thinking about now. Lady Evelyn continued, But the Lord of Glengavin is amicable toward the green cloaks. He should provide a welcome, or at least no hindrance. The surroundings are quite wild, and I doubt you'd be able to find it without this. Where are we now? Roland asked. Lady Evelyn traced a line southward. Here. Oh, Connor said in a surprised, glad sort of yelp. We're near Trunswick. It's on the way. What's Trunswick? Roland asked. And why does it make you say, oh, like an overexcited pigeon? It's where I used to be a servant, Connor said, and my family works the land near there. You don't have time for detours, Green Cloak boy, Lady Evelyn said. Stick to the task. Connor's face fell. Right, sure, of course. Roland couldn't help it. He hated to see Connor looking so crestfallen. Maybe we could still spend the night in Transwick tomorrow. Not home, but close, right? Immediately, Connor's face brightened. I'm sure they'd give us a warm welcome, and my mother. Lady Evelyn interrupted with a vague frown. I feel as if I have heard a rumour about Transwick. Good or bad? asked Roland. She tapped her remaining teeth with a stick. Something about green cloaks and the devourer. Or maybe it was Trinsfield. Or Brunswick. Trunbridge? Was that the one we were talking about? Connor pointed to the map. Trunswick, right there, she said. Lovely place, I'm sure. Chapter 6 Hawkers they, Finn, Malin, and Abeka, were hiding. Along with Uraza, they were tucked between two boulders, as far as the eye could see, which wasn't very far in the darkness. There were man-sized, teeth-shaped stones pressed shoulder to shoulder. While Abeka marvelled over the strangeness of the landscape and listened to the night, Malin and Finn argued, "Tonight is not a night to die." Finn whispered hoarsely. Malin's voice was cross. I wasn't suggesting we die. I was suggesting we go back for the others. At this point, both of those things are the same, he muttered back. Shh! Abeka shushed them as quietly as she could. She jabbed a finger into the darkness. Finn and Malin turned to look where she pointed. Uraza was already looking, her ears swiveling to and fro. The Black Knight kept most of its secrets, but Abeka could hear the wet squelch of a man's footprint on stone. One of the conquerors, close by. Maylin opened her mouth. Abeka held her finger to her lips. It had taken them hours to rid themselves of the group they'd first encountered in the forest. By then they had lost track of Connor, Rolan, and Tariq, and would have lost their way as well, if not for Finn's knowledge as a guide. The sound of the man's footsteps came closer. Uraza stiffened. Abeka felt the vibration of an inaudible growl through the leopard's ribs pressed against her. Finn stretched out a hand. Don't move. Holding their breath, they listened to the man climb over the boulders near them. All he had to do was clamber over two or three more, and he would discover them and alert his allies. The conqueror scraped over another boulder. His breath huffed out noisily as he landed at the base of it. Abeka suspected that he wasn't truly looking for them, or he would have minded how loud he was. But then again, maybe not. Abeka was always surprised by most people's ignorance of their own noisiness. It was one of the reasons why Finn's deliberate stealth impressed her. Suddenly, the conqueror's breath was quite near. He was on the other side of the boulder Abeka knelt behind. If there had been any light at all, she probably would have been able to see his face through the gap between the rocks. 
every muscle in Uraza's body was knitted solid. Abeka's heart pounded so loudly in her ears that she could barely hear anything else. She pressed her fingers into Uraza's fur. Slowly, her pulse calmed. Now she heard the sound of the man's palm as he felt his way along the stone. He was so close. Finn closed his eyes. Strangely enough, he looked quite serene. One of his arms hugged his chest so that his fingertips could touch his upper bicep. Is that where his spirit animal is? Abeka wondered. Needle-fine claws scritched on stone as the conqueror's spirit animal joined him. Abeka heard the click of hungry jaws. Somehow, a small hungry spirit animal seemed more terrifying than a large one in this darkness, as if you maybe wouldn't notice it until it was right on you. Then the conqueror's voice sounded roughly. Come on, Tan. His footsteps receded as he headed away with whatever sort of animal Tan was. After a very, very long silence, Finn blew out a relieved sigh. Herbeka released her handful of leopard fur. Uraza's tenseness oozed from her. Maylin turned to Finn. Do we have a regroup point to reconnect with Tariq and the others? Abeka was unsurprised to hear her sounding efficient and strategic. That girl's heart was a battlefield. We did, Finn said, a local green cloak waypoint. But we've passed it, and we'd have to risk fighting back toward it. I think we should continue on to Trunswick. Even if the others aren't there, we can try to get a message to Greenhaven. Abeka thought of the terrible fight in the woods and shuddered. She hoped the others were all right. Message? How? Gilded pigeons carry messages from many large towns in Eura, Finn answered. Most green cloaks know where to find someone who runs the birds. I wonder if I could send a message to my family, Abeka thought. Finn must have sensed her interest because his expression softened and he added, I will teach you how to send messages if it comes to that. Maylin eyed Abeka suspiciously but said nothing. What? What did I do? Oh, Abeka thought dismally. I wonder if she thinks I want to send messages to the enemy. She wished there was a way that she could reassure the other girl, but there didn't seem to be a way to without sounding even more suspicious. So she just said, So we go now to Transwick? It's still quite a ways from here, Finn said. He pushed to his feet stiffly. Let's find a place to sleep some place a bit more comfortable. By more comfortable, Finn meant sleeping under rocks instead of on top of them. They spent a rather brittle night beneath a rock overhang on the edge of the boulder field. It wasn't cosy, but at least it was dry and out of the wind. Abeka and Uraza curled up together like siblings and fell asleep. In the morning light, their surroundings looked quite different, Coming from Nilo, Abeka had never seen anything like the landscape. Behind them was the expanse of strange square boulders, and before them was a flat, purple-green field that went on and on. Finn looked somehow at home here. All his green-purple tattoos matched the colours of the grass, and his silver hair matched the clouds that pressed low. Those rocks are called the giant's chessboard, and this is a moor he explained to them. It looks quite innocent, but it can be treacherous. The ground is soft in places and will happily swallow a person or a panda. Maylin, stretching elegantly, said, I'll keep G in passive form today. Do you think it's safe to let Uraza walk? Abeka asked, resting her fingers on the leopard's shoulder blades. She prefers to run when she can, like me. I think so, Finn said. Cats are careful, but if we see anyone coming, it would probably be best to hide her. I guess there is no mistaking her for an ordinary leopard, Abeka said. Uraza preened at the admiration in Abeka's voice. Not many ordinary leopards in Eura anyway, Finn noted. Much less extraordinary ones. They set off across the moor. 
The ground beneath them shifted from hard-packed rocks to watery silt without warning. If a becker hadn't been paying attention, she could have been in hidden water above her head before she had a chance to cry out. In fact, only a few moments had passed before disaster struck. It wasn't that a becker heard something, it was that she suddenly didn't hear something. A second later, she realized it was Maylin's breathing. She didn't hear it anymore because Maylin wasn't there anymore. Her becker spun this way and that, but there was only motionless moor ahead and behind her. Finn, she cried. Finn understood immediately. Where? I don't know. They both scanned the moor for any sign of the other girl, but even Uraza couldn't pinpoint where she had gone. Her becker was too aware that every second that passed was a second Maylin couldn't breathe. Uraza, Finn said urgently. Any ideas? Nothing. Then, Maylin's arm burst into sight. It looked as if it grew from the tufted grass. Her fingers felt for the foliage, seized it. There was no way she would be able to pull herself out, but she was going to try. Leaping forward, Finn gripped her forearm with one tattooed hand. He stretched out his other hand to a becker. Don't let us both go in, he warned. Grabbing his hand, a becker braced herself. Then she hauled and Finn hauled, and the moor gave Maylin up like a newborn calf. She sprawled across the grass rather unbeautifully and spat out some muddy bits of water. Welcome back, Finn told Maylin, a little out of breath. I was doing fine, she retorted, spitting out another glob of dirty grass. Finn's mouth made a crafty shape. He said, A becker and I will know better next time. Abeka hid a smile. Maylin was already retrieving the bag she'd dropped when she'd disappeared. She seemed completely unfazed by the experience. As she took down her damp hair and shook her head, she muttered, It is going to take forever for my clothing to dry in this climate. I did say to be cautious, Finn said. Let's use our heads. The image of Maylin's hand extended from the hungry moor did keep Abeka careful for quite a bit of their journey that day. But then she began to notice how gifted Uraza was at finding dry spots to leap from. She also discovered that if she really focused on the leopard, she could sense them too. Soon the two of them were dancing across the moor. Laughing, they outstripped the others. After a few minutes, however, Abeka and Uraza hesitated. Up ahead, a becker got the sense of people. Then, a second later, she caught a glimpse of distant figures. Uraza, she called. She held out her arm and the leopard vanished onto it without pause. The sting of it was more like a flush of heat now. It felt good, powerful, like Uraza was somehow becoming a part of her. She felt as if she could still feel the leopard beside her. What is it? Malin asked as she and Finn caught up. Finn followed Abeka's gaze to the approaching silhouettes. As they grew closer, Abeka could see that one of them carried a pike with a stubby red and white flag on it. I don't like this, he said. I think they're hawkers. Malin's eyes narrowed. What's a hawker? They're scoundrels who sell fake nectar. Finn's voice had turned dark. They also sell the pelts of spirit animals. What? Abeka exclaimed. Why? Finn's fingers rested lightly on his complex tattoos. There is a dirty superstition that wearing the pelt of a spirit animal will give you their powers, even if you weren't able to summon one yourself. You two must hide the fact that you have spirit animals, or the hawkers might be tempted to attack you. Maylin and Abeka wordlessly tugged their sleeves down. As the figures approached, dragging a small cart behind them, Maylin dropped her gaze and slumped her shoulders. She was transformed immediately to a docile and shy farm girl. Abeka ducked her head hurriedly. She wasn't sure she was as gifted an actress as Maylin, though. Hello, 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 said the first of the hawkers. He had a very winning smile. It looked made out of rubber, like it could stretch and stretch and never break. 
If Finn hadn't been uneasy before, Abeka probably would have trusted this newcomer. Fine morning to you, said the woman beside him. She also appeared friendly, though she seemed to be made out of porridge instead of rubber, all soft dimples and warmth. On a journey with your daughters, servants? Abeka and Maylin shot irritated glances at each other. Finn replied in his quiet, unaffected way. Foster daughters. Oh and oh, the man said. I hear in your voice you're from the north too. The hawker said it aggressively, a taunt or a dare, but Finn did not waver. That's where we are headed. They will learn to sing for those with troubled bonds. A noble calling, the woman said. Noble, agreed the rubbery man. Troubled bonds and troubled bonds, eh? How old are you lot? Old enough. Do you have spirit animals, little daughters? Melin actually managed to blush as she turned her face away, looking too bashful to even think of answering. Rebecca kept her head ducked and hoped they'd think she was too shy as well. She was beginning to change her mind about trusting the smiling man. Do you know the legend of the black wild cat? The rubbery man asked. Finn's mouth thinned. Maylin shook her head imperceptibly. Rebecca didn't move at all. Going to the north and don't know the legend of the black wildcat, exclaimed the porridge woman. For years, the north has had its stories of giant black cats wandering its moors. Wondrous things, these wild cats, big as a horse, fierce, full of magic. Finn said, his voice flat. There are no black wild cats in the north anymore. Oh, you and you, said the rubbery man. Have faith. There's a prophecy that says a boy will bond with the black wildcat and deliver the north from persecution and poverty. That will lead us all to a glorious, peaceful future. Maybe one of you is the child of the prophecy, the porridge woman exclaimed. Rebecca forgot to be bashful. She said, I'm not a boy. The rubbery man grinned and pointed at her. Well spotted, but we can sell you a potion that will force the bond. We don't have to wait for the legend to come true. We can make it come true. Finn said, there's no such potion, and there is no black wildcat of the north. Not anymore. Oh, that is where you are wrong, funny little man, said the porridge woman. She grandly let the door to their small cart fall open, revealing a rainbow of bottles, books, and colourful flotsam. A caged black animal peered out. When it saw Abeka's face, it mewled. Maylin was unable to disguise her scorn. Her voice was anything but demure. That's a house cat. It's a baby black wild cat, the rubbery man said. It's a full-grown house cat, Maylin insisted. It will get larger, she scoffed. I think it's plenty large enough for a house cat. The cat stood on its back legs and pressed the small black pads of its feet against the cage bars. Abeka's heart and Uraza's tattoo stirred. Oh, Abeka said suddenly, it's cruel to keep it locked up. You should set it free. And lose our livelihood, the rubbery man said. Indeed, no. Abeka burst out. Can we buy it from you? Not to bond with, just to have. It really is only a cat. Finn and Maylin stared at her. So did the rubbery man and the porridge woman. What will you buy it with? The rubbery man asked. Abeka had no money. They'd packed everything they needed. And anyway, back in Nilo, everything was bartered and traded for. There was no need for money. Hesitantly, she said, I will trade you for my bracelet. It's made of real elephant tail hair, all the way from Nilo, and it is good luck. Oh, a becker, Maylin said with disgust. It's a cat. Finn said nothing, just crossed his arms. Rubbery man and porridge woman consulted. A becker knew it sounded crazy. She couldn't explain her affinity for the cat, but it felt a little like her bond with Uraza. All right and all right, agreed the rubbery man. 
for the price of your good luck charm. That seems fair. So Rebecca handed over her bracelet, thinking, I'm sorry, Soma, I hope you will understand. The porridge woman unlocked the cage and gave the little black cat to Rebecca. As Rebecca accepted it, the sleeves of her cloak slid to her elbows. For just a moment, her bare skin was exposed and her tattoo was revealed to the air. Hurriedly, Rebecca shook her sleeve back down. Maybe they didn't see it, she thought. But she knew from the rubbery man's suddenly sharp expression that he had. So you have bonded, he said, grabbing her wrist. Every ounce of friendliness had drained from his voice. Quick as anything, he had a knife in his hand. The knife was the opposite of his smile in every way. It was thin and unforgiving, and as black as a lonely night. And it was pointed right at a becker. Produce your spirit animal, he ordered, or I will cut your throat. A becker couldn't give a rasa to these people, but she didn't know what else to do. Finn was motionless, his gaze fixed hypnotically on the knife. It was as if the true Finn had gone somewhere else and left just his body behind. Rebecca didn't know what was wrong with him, but she knew she didn't have a chance without the help of Finn or Uraza. Suddenly, there was a blur of motion. The rubbery man released Rebecca's wrist. He fell backward with a tremendous woof as the air was knocked out of him. Maylin stood over him, pointing his own knife at his throat. She was glorious and fierce, loose strands of her black hair snaking around her angry face. It's insulting enough that you sold us a stray cat, but this is beyond insulting. Here is my bargain. Give this girl back her bracelet, and I won't cut your throat. The porridge woman started to move, and Maylin threw up her other hand. With a flash of blue light, G appeared. The rubbery man and the porridge woman stared, mouths agape. The little cat in Abeka's arms clung to her neck. It was a very clawsome hug. Here is a legend, Malin snapped, gesturing to G. The panda looked imaginary and grand in the grey-green surroundings. The four fallen have returned. We will defeat the conquerors, and we will be the ones to usher in a peaceful world. I suggest you find something other than lies to sell. There was absolute silence. G, whispered the porridge woman. Malin gestured toward Abeka. Abeka released Uraza in another flash of green light. The massive leopard did look legendary, her violet eyes ablaze. Uraza, murmured the porridge woman. Impossible. The rubbery man held out the bracelet. Finn took it from him without a word. Malin smiled sharply at the hawkers. Spread the word. The great beasts are back. Then she turned to Finn and Abeka. What are we waiting for? We have work to do. Chapter 7 Transwick Connor really was doing his best to be a good partner with Brigan. Sometimes it was easy. He'd grown up with sheepdogs, and Brigan could be quite dog-like. He liked for Connor to toss clumps of sod for him to fetch. He played gleeful tug-of-war with vines. He always let Connor lead to show that he trusted him to be in charge. But sometimes, he was nothing like a dog, and Connor was never sure if this was because he was acting more like a wolf specifically, or acting more like a great beast in general. For instance, the family sheepdogs had always been eager to curl up to sleep beside Connor, but Brigan, no matter how cold the night, slept at least a few feet from him, the sheepdogs had absolutely hated to be stared at. But if Connor caught Brigan's gaze, the wolf held it unblinkingly until Connor became uncomfortable. And he really did howl at the moon. Connor had spent so many nights being terrified of that sound, wondering when the wolves would appear, wondering if he'd be able to keep them from killing any sheep, wondering if he'd be able to keep them from killing him. If he was being honest, he tried so hard with Brigan to hide the fact that he was still 
a little afraid of him. Home sweet home, eh? Roland asked, shielding his eyes. They had made it to Trunswick, finally. The others had never made it to the tower, so Roland and Connor had started across the fields alone. They had walked and walked and walked, jumping at the slightest noise, fearing conquerors, dangerous animals, or conquerors with dangerous animals. They had stopped to snatch a few nervous hours of sleep, long enough for Connor to have a fuzzy dream of both rumpus and a large, wild-looking hare sleeping in a patch of wisteria, and then walked some more. Now the town rose up above them. The castle stood at the highest point of the hill. Blue-roofed houses made of sandy-coloured stone crowded below it. Brilliant blue flags and banners flew from nearly every roof, as if the town were waving a frantic greeting to the boys. Connor knew that all the standards would feature Brigan, Yora's patron beast. He felt a warm flood of relief. It had been such a nerve-wracking journey without either of the older green cloaks. But now, here was familiar old Trunswick. Everything would be all right, surely. So this is Trunswick, Roland observed. Where you have fond memories of being sold into servitude by your father? Connor's cheeks heated. I wasn't sold. Loaned, then, Roland corrected warmly. Oh, don't look so beaten up over it. My father rudely up and died on me, so I reckon he's the worst parent. Oh, hey, you did say a warm welcome, right? He pointed toward the town. Did you mean warm like burning? A plume of smoke rose from the opposite side of the town. Vaguely uneasy, Connor said, Sometimes the farmers burn their fields to kill the thistles and heather. Come on, we'll go in a side way. A sandy-coloured wall that matched the sandy-coloured houses surrounded Trunswick. There were several unguarded gates. The main gate was always crowded, so Connor led them toward the nearly hidden one nearest to the castle. He paused, tipping his head back. Two blue flags flew over the gate, just like before. But, unlike before, Brigand's silhouette was missing. In its place was the outline of a bulky black cat. The change was so absolutely unexpected and so wrong that Connor couldn't immediately process the truth of it. Slowly, he asked Rolan, Am I awake? Is this a trick question? Connor had grown up under the image of a grey wolf on a blue field. Brigand's iconic image had flown over every state event. Every family had a wolf figure on their mantle, or a howling wolf carved into the wood above the doorway. Brigand was Yura. But now, there was a blue flag with a wildcat flying over the gate. It seemed like it should be a dream, or a hallucination. Roland had noticed Connor's goggling at the flag, so Connor stammered, that's supposed to be Brigan. What? The cat? Looks a little like Urasa. This cat was far more muscled than a becker's leopard, but Connor saw the resemblance. If he hadn't known any better, he would have thought it was supposed to be the silly wild cat from the children's stories he'd grown up with. Hadn't every child in Yura heard about the hero who would rise up with a black cat? It had been an inspiring sort of myth. But Trunswick didn't need a myth. They had Brigan. He was back. He was real. Before Connor had time to wonder about this out loud, a huge mastiff burst from the other side of the entrance. It bayed, jowls slobbery. The noise rumbled in their feet. Its threatening bark called out a second dog. Connor knew these were no ordinary hounds. The Trunswick's mastiffs were infamous for their fight to the death training. It wasn't their bite that was deadly, although it was formidable. It was their hold. The mastiffs were trained to find a grip on their victims' throats and not let go until a Trunswick guard gave the order. Brace yourself, Connor warned. I don't get along with dogs, Roland muttered, reaching toward the dagger he wore by his side. Brigand's ears pinned and his tail dropped. But the mastiffs merely circled, and pushed them forward. 
this wasn't an attack. It was an escort. Spirit animals, Connor asked Roland. Slobber animals, Roland replied, holding his hands out of the way of their drooling mouths. What's going on? Is this slimy greeting usual? Before Connor could reply, a guard shouted at them from his post at the gate. Hey, you! The mastiffs herded the two boys closer. A few feet away, Connor saw that the guard wore a blue Transwick surcoat over his chainmail. But, as on the flag, the wolf insignia had been replaced with a black wildcat. Behind him, another three mastiffs emerged. The guard tugged Connor's cloak, rubbing mud off between his thumb and forefinger and revealing the colour beneath. Green cloaks! The contempt in his voice when he said the word was as shocking as anything else that had happened. You can come quietly to the prison, or you can make this difficult. Of all the ways Connor had imagined this day would go, this had not been one of them. Roland said, Keep your shirt on, old man. We haven't done anything wrong. Stunned, Connor stammered, Please, I'm not a stranger. I used to be Devon Trunswick's servant. I, I lived here. How foolish he felt, just a bumbling shepherd facing these castle guards, unable to explain himself. Quietly, the guard repeated. A few people had gathered behind him, anticipating drama. Or difficult. As he moved toward them, Brigan let loose a rippling snarl. No, Brigan, Connor said. There were five of the dogs and only one Brigan. Although Brigan was superior in most ways to each dog, if one of the mastiffs got him by the throat, he'd be powerless against the other four. We're not here to fight. He felt Roland's attention on him, waiting for him to somehow sort this out. This was his hometown, after all. But this was no Transwick Connor knew. Not with that strange animal on the blue flag. Not with this guard, this strangely bloodthirsty crowd. These mastiffs? A familiar voice rang out. What's the commotion? Inside the gate, people and animals parted for the newcomer. An animal led the way. A large black cat, waist tall. Its eyes were golden, and its pelt was silky, inky black, with even blacker spots that showed in the sun. A black panther. As it stalked dangerously down the cobblestones, a boy stepped out behind it. Devin Trunswick. His posture was even haughtier than before. His clothing was impeccable. Everything about him shouted that he was a lord's son. Connor felt so foolish for thinking that anything might have changed between them because of Brigan. How ridiculous, Connor thought. I'm still a shepherd's son, and he's still a noble. We won't ever be equal. Devin's eyes found Connor's, and held them. He seemed to be thinking the same thing. Devin held out his arm. Without a second's pause, the panther vanished. A tattoo appeared on Devin's arm. Connor inhaled audibly. Impossible. It was absolutely impossible. Connor had been at the nectar ceremony where Devin had failed to call up a spirit animal. He had been standing right beside him, close enough to see the disappointment painted on his mouth. His mother hadn't mentioned this in her letter. Connor's pulse fluttered. Where is my mother? Devin, he called, trying to cover his surprise. It's me, Connor, Devin said. I know. Then he called to the guards, cool and imperious. What are you waiting for? Seize them. Roland grabbed Connor's elbow. Together, they jumped away. One of the guards snatched at Connor, but he rolled out of the way. Brigand snapped at the mastiffs. They were stronger, but slower. And there was absolutely no reason to engage them. They had no purpose here in Transwick. Connor knew these streets. If he could get to the smaller alleys, he might be able to lead Roland and Brigand out of danger. He ran down an alley. Beside him, Brigand jumped on top of crates, his powerful hind legs sending them crashing behind him. Essex coursed overhead, her shadow shrinking and growing 
as she ducked beneath clotheslines and over jutting roofs. A girl shouted out a window, Run, green cloaks! Connor barely had time to look up before the girl's mother dragged her inside and clapped the window closed. The mother's expression was frightened. Farther ahead, more windows opened. A boy and a girl waved at Connor, and then, just after Connor and Rolan had passed, they tipped buckets of scalding hot water into the alleyway. The pursuing guards yelled in pain. Steam curled up the walls. The children were helping Connor and Rolan escape. Connor had no breath to thank them, but he waved and hoped they understood. I'll remember that, one of the guards shouted at the windows. His hand clapped over his scalded face. Connor and Rolan left them behind, not slowing. Connor knew that there was a hidden weakness in the wall nearby. If they could just make it there, they could leave Transwick behind and escape across the moors. But as Connor darted down a side street, a huge lizard, as long as Brigan, suddenly loomed from the darkness. Its face and clawed feet were black, but the rest of its bumpy hide was a checkerboard of orange and black. Everything about it looked poisonous. It hissed like something out of a nightmare. Connor scrabbled in the other direction. Behind him, he heard snarls and cries. He couldn't see Brigan or Rolan. It felt like there were walls and people everywhere. An older girl with a flat frog in her hands. Another girl with the giant lizard. And Devon, with his leering smile. As he spun, Connor was brought up short by a fourth person, a tall, dark-skinned boy and his spirit animal, a long-legged chestnut bird with a big stork-like head. The bird was tall enough to look right into his eyes. Possibly it was adrenaline, but the hair on Connor's arms felt charged, like when lightning had struck very close. I'd suggest giving in, the boy said. My hammer cop here has a very short temper. Also, added the girl holding the flat frog, because we have your spirit animal. The mastiffs had pinned Brigand to the ground. Connor's heart sank when he saw that one of them had bracketed its jaws loosely around Brigand's windpipe. The wolf's eyes flashed, full of rebellion, but he had no choice but to submit. Also, also, Devin said, we have this one. His cloak seems slightly less green than yours. He pointed to Rolan who squirmed and thrashed in a guard's hands. Behind them, a tall, handsome man in a richly embroidered cloak watched the proceedings with an approving smile. Two little piggies, the man said, and one not-so-big, not-so-bad wolf. Roland sneered and spat at him. The man seemed unconcerned. If anything, Roland's rage pleased him. You had your chance to choose sides, Rolan. We both see you chose poorly. This man knew Rolan? Connor tried to place him. Was he from the castle? A guard? No. His mind returned to the mountains of Amaya, where Barlow, their ally, their friend, had been slain, stabbed through the back while saving a beggar's life. This was Zarif, a conqueror. We've delivered ourselves to the enemy, Connor thought, cursing himself. All because I wanted to come back here. Why? This isn't home. This place has always been a trap. All because I wanted to return to a place where I'd always been trapped. Now I'm trapped all over again. He couldn't explain to Rolan how sorry he was. The crowd parted for the Earl himself. He looked exactly like his son, Devin, only he had a pointy, neatly trimmed beard. He surveyed them coldly. Put them both in the howling house. We'll decide what to do with them later. To Connor and Rolan, he said, Place your spirit animals in passive form now. Yeah, Devin agreed. It'd be too bad if we had to hurt a great beast. His nasty smile indicated he didn't think it would be too bad at all. Wait, Roland snapped. What are we being imprisoned for? We've done nothing, Connor said. He unsuccessfully searched the Earl's face for any trace of compassion. 
And you know I'm not a stranger to Trunswick. The Earl barely glanced at them. It was obvious he didn't find Roland or Connor worthy enough to get the full attention he'd give a proper enemy. He said, The cloak you wear here condemns you, boy. Trunswick has heard enough of the Green Cloak's iron rule. We're weary of all their talk of Erdos's destiny. He lifted a lazy hand toward a blue flag bearing the wildcat. Erdos, indeed. All this talk of our destiny. Trunswick will make its own destiny. Connor protested. My lord, we only came to. The earl held up his hand as if he were calming a dog. Please be quiet. I will no longer tolerate hearing the voices of the likes of you. The likes of you. His voice oozed dismissal. It was like a slap. Connor had not been hit, but he felt the same urge to sink to his knees. The same rush of blood to his cheeks, the same thud of his heart in his ribcage. Devon was trying very hard to hide a smile. Zarif nodded approvingly, as if he was so pleased the Earl had finally stopped letting those green cloaks push him around. The Earl turned to the guard beside him. If the boy won't put his animal into passive form, have the dogs kill it and burn the body with the rest. Roland's eyes widened, his cool facade dropping. Connor wordlessly stretched his hand toward where Brigan was pinned to the ground. The wolf immediately vanished from beneath the mastiffs and appeared on Connor's arm. Roland, however, had no such success. With a scowl, he called to Essex, but the falcon flew high overhead in ever wider circles. Every so often the bird looked down so that it was clear she was listening, just not obeying. Devin and the girl with the frog snickered. Zarif yawned. It was a glorious yawn, his hand elegantly covering his mouth and his laugh at once. Behind them, Connor could see Devon's little brother, Dawson, averting his eyes. He'd always been the best one in the family. It was hard to imagine him taking any joy in this horrible scene, but he was too young to help now. The boy's bond is weak, the earl said. So the bird's no threat anyway. Just leave it and lock the others up. Welcome home, shepherd, Devin sneered. Chapter 8 The Howling House It didn't take Essex long to find Maylin, Abeka, and Finn. They were just climbing a grassy bank that afforded a view of Transwick when Finn spotted the falcon circling. He waved one arm and then two, Rebecca and Maylin joined in. Essex wheeled toward them. It's Essex. Does that mean something's happened to Roland? Maylin asked. The thought annoyed her. If someone was going to hurt that boy, she wanted it to be her. Essex doesn't seem alarmed enough for him to be dead, Finn said. Rebecca winced, but Maylin appreciated that Finn didn't try to sugarcoat the possibilities for them. Lives were at stake. It would do them all well to remember that. Finn shielded his eyes to better see the falcon. But she seems agitated. It's hard to see if Roland sent her to us, or if she's come on her own accord. Do you see a message tied to her leg? Nothing, Malin verified. Are they in Transwick? Finn called up to Essex. The bird shrieked back three times. Malin said, I think that means yes. Finn asked the falcon, Should we meet up with them right now? Essex cried out once. It was an angry, ferocious bark of a sound. Quite clearly, no. Imprisoned, I would guess, Finn said, or working secretly to get information. Either way, we'll have to be cautious. Maylin considered. She touched the tattoo where G waited in passive form. It wasn't nearly as effective as the meditation sessions, but the gesture reminded her of that clarity of thought. She asked, Should we circle the town to see if we can learn any more? Finn nodded. Probably a wise idea. I shouldn't really go marching into town without some strategy anyway. The Earl of Trunswick and I had a disagreement not too long ago. 
What sort of disagreement? Melin demanded. Finn narrowed his eyes in the direction of the castle. He tried to kill me. That seemed like a valid reason to avoid going into town. In any case, it would be advantageous to have a plan, he added. Abeka made a little pained noise. At first, Malin thought it was because of worry, but then she saw, no, it was because the hawker's ridiculous black cat thought Essex was going to eat her. The cat had affixed its claws rather securely into Abeka's hair. It looked as if the animal was actually growing directly from the other girl's head. You could let that cat down, Malin said scathingly. You wanted to free her, and now she's free. Abeka tried to remove the cat from her head. Reams of her own hair stretched from her scalp to the cat. She's scared, insisted Abeka, still tugging. The cat let out a rattling wail that oscillated in time with the tugs. She won't slow us down. Maylin narrowed her eyes, but it was hard to argue. Abeka had been seeming a little more feline lately, more like Uraza. Maybe this was part of it. Good, keep it that way. The others need us, whether or not they're in immediate trouble. The sooner we find out more and meet back up with them, the sooner we can get to Rumpus. Now let's get out of here, unless you want the conquerors to catch us. Before Maylin could stop herself, the insinuation slipped out. The prospect that Abeka might not mind the conquerors finding them at all, since she might still be working for them. Finn leveled a very heavy look at her. Tariq or Olven would have probably scolded her for talking to Abeka like that, but she thought they also would have understood why, deep down, Maylin still didn't trust Abeka. And it was hard to be very kind to someone she didn't trust, now more than ever. But Finn simply turned away, and under his breath said something only Mei Ling could hear. Trust must be practiced. Mei Ling wanted to roll her eyes and ignore him. But his words, and his quiet disapproval, rankled her. Somewhere along the way, she had started wanting to impress him. This annoyed her for reasons she couldn't quite find words for. Why should she care for the respect of a man who wouldn't even lift a sword to save himself at that forest battle? But he had led them across the giant's chessboard and the moor, and had pulled her from the waist, and without his advice in the moon tower, she would have never learned about G's problem-solving abilities. What is a warrior's heart? she wondered. Does it always carry a sword? Grudgingly, she said out loud, Abeka, I'm sorry if my words seemed harsh. I didn't mean them that way. Abeka's eyebrows shot up. She appeared so surprised by this miserly kindness. Was it possible Mei Lin had been a little too uncaring the past several days? Just because she sometimes doubted Abeka's loyalties didn't mean she had to be so cruel about it. Finn looked over his shoulder. He didn't say anything. Not a word. But he nodded, and Melin's heart felt lighter. They climbed over the bank, down toward Trunswick, keeping enough distance to avoid attracting any unwanted attention. Melin searched the town's appearance for any clues as to what kind of place this could be, and what their friends could be up to inside it. The town's structure was straightforward, castle crowning the hill, buildings huddled around it. It stank of beeswax, smoke, coal, and the peculiar scent of horse hooves, so Maylin could tell already that it had more than its fair share of blacksmiths. The blue flags that flew from nearly every roof flapped listlessly, made of heavy wool rather than the silk and linen flags that Maylin had grown up under. The entire town seemed crude and disheveled in comparison to Zhang's elegant cities, and Maylin felt a pang in her heart. She pushed it down. No time for weakness or second-guessing her decision to stay now. Ah, Trunswick, said Finn. His voice had gone a little flat. It was a bit like his face had gone when the hawker had brandished the knife. What is that over there? Maylin asked. Over a nearby knot of trees, a patch of sky was dark with smoke. 
Lifting her chin, Abeka sniffed the air. I think it's a bonfire. It's not just wood they are burning anyway. Do you smell it? Abeka was right. There was something a little off about the odour of the fire. Something a little unpleasant that made her feel anxious. Shong, burning. She pushed the thought away as her eyes stung. Finn interrupted her thoughts by saying, It doesn't feel like a good sign. Finn, I think Essex is trying to tell us something, Abeka said. She pointed in the other direction, toward Transwick, or rather, since she was holding the cat with both hands, she pointed with the cat to where Essex circled over a large building part way up the hill. Do you think the others are in that building? It would be bad luck if they were, Finn said. That's the Howling House. It's where they keep people and animals who bonded without nectar and developed the bonding sickness. Well, one sort of bonding sickness. It's for those who went mad. It's part hospital and part prison. Millen's mind turned over his words. Those who went mad. She had heard of the bonding sickness, of course. Everyone learned about the dangers of bonding without the nectar. In the days before nectar, some bonds went well, and other bonds didn't. Human and animal were tied to each other, and yet couldn't connect. Sleepless nights piled one upon the other. Some were able to work through it on their own, or learned to live with the difficult bond. But others, as Finn noted, went mad. This was why even the most remote village in Zhong had a designated authority to notify the green cloaks when a child came of age. It was hard to imagine anyone bonding without nectar these days, harder still to imagine enough difficult bonds to warrant an entire prison. Malin asked, You think they're being kept prisoner there? It's the only place that would hold them and their spirit animals, yes. Everything inside that building is reinforced to prevent spirit animals from escaping. Malin said, How do you know so much about that place? Finn didn't answer. He'd gone all quiet and far away again. Suddenly she remembered what he had said in the moon tower. He had bonded to Don without the nectar. What had he called his bond? Difficult. Difficult enough to be locked up in the Earl of Transwick's house for insane humans and animals? Difficult enough that the Earl of Transwick might have tried to kill him? So now what? Abeka demanded. All three of them looked toward the sun in the sky. Finn said, We wait. He held out his arm, and Essex coasted smoothly down to land heavily on it. Abeka settled to the ground, opened her bag, and pulled out some jerky to munch on. They all seemed content to wait. Waiting was Maylin's least favorite thing. Transwick was a silent place after dark. When night fell, a becker, Maylin, and Finn crept closer to town. Unlike the cities of Zhong, which were lit and beautiful even at night, Transwick was nearly as black as the moor. Only a few lanterns illuminated the main street up to the castle. There were no candles in any of the windows. No voices rose from the bars, and no stragglers moved through the streets. Even Transwick's famous and industrious blacksmiths completely disappeared as night fell, leaving behind only a few glowing embers in their forges. Guards stood in vigilant silence at each of the gates. Finn whispered, There's something very wrong with this tone. Melin, Finn and Abeka crouched around the back of the wall. There were no gates here, no one to see them but that meant there were no easy entrances either. In a low voice, Abeka asked Uraza, Can you find us a weakness in the wall? The leopard galloped away, low and silky. She returned a few minutes later to lead them to a bricked-up gate. Some of the barrier had crumbled, leaving an opening just large enough for a person to crawl through. Maylin kept G in passive form. The gap was not large enough for a giant panda. On the inside of the wall, the soundless nature of the town was even more pronounced. 
Maylin was very aware of their footfalls on the uneven cobblestones as Finn led the way up the narrow roads toward the howling house. Uraza trailed behind, ears swiveling as she listened for threats. Overhead, Essex's dark form flitted from roof to roof, confirming they were headed in the right direction. At the howling house, torches blazed, their fiery reflections thrashing in the puddles of last night's rain. Out front, guards moved restlessly. At least three large mastiffs lay just inside the door. It was a hive of activity in comparison to the quiet town. This seems impossible, Malin whispered to Finn. Patience, he whispered back. Malin wasn't very fond of patience. Rebecca whispered to Uraza, and the two of them danced quietly through the shadows, finding an invisible path around the side of the fortified barn. The leopard led them to a hiding space in a blacksmith's shop, directly across the narrow road from the howling house. It was full of the things one would expect to find in a smith's shop. Anvil, furnace, wrought iron fire dogs for holding wood, but was also cluttered with cabinetry and farming equipment. In the smith's, a becker crouched behind a half-built cabinet. Finn took a place behind a large harrow. Maylin hid beside the still warm forge. The blacksmith was on the higher side of the road, and from their hiding places, they had a clear view into one of the only rooms with a normal-sized window. Inside, there were five people eating a not insubstantial meal. One very handsome, oily man, and four kids. The last time Mei Lin had seen the man, with his tidy beard and expensive clothing, he had been stabbing one of her allies in the back during the battle for the last talisman. Just the sight of him placing a spoon in his mouth was enough to close off her throat for a moment. She barely checked her first impulse, which was to leap across the road and engage him in combat on the spot. Serif! Mei Lin and Abeka snarled at the same time. Their voices were equally harsh, which surprised Mei Lin. She still didn't trust Abeka, but her rage at Zarif sounded genuine. Uraza's tail thrashed at the abrasive tone. Finn said, I'll stand watch here. You two go listen. Abeka handed Finn the cat, and Mei Lin shook her head with annoyance. What are you planning to do with that thing anyway? She demanded. Throw it at Rumpus? But Abeka merely smiled, cool and cat-like, before following Maylin to the window. The voices inside were mumbled, but audible. Don't be foolish, Sirif was saying in between bites of dinner. Maylin was disgusted to watch him eat, not because he wasn't careful, but because of the opposite. For some reason, the care he took to place each bite in his mouth and then wipe his lips infuriated her. How dare he eat? like there is nothing wrong in the world. How dare he wipe his beard clean, as if it matters if he is handsome. No one will care about the great beasts when we're done, he continued. Did you see any of the townsfolk caring a whit for Brigand today? They only had eyes for Elder. Devin preened as he admired his wildcat tattoo. She is everything the people want. That's what I am telling you, children, Zarif said. The older blonde girl with the flat frog looked rather annoyed at the word children. For decades, the green cloaks lured in most people with their talk of Erdos's great beasts. By making every village everywhere reliant on the green cloaks and the nectar, they denied the power every country already has. Brigan serves no one but Brigan. But you, Devin, you serve Yura with their black wildcat. And you, Talia, serve your people with Tidalic, Stetriol's beloved water-holding frog. Anna, with Amaya's glorious and fearful Gila monster, Ix. And of course, Carmo, with Impundulo, Nilo's lightning bird. How long have your people been waiting for these legends to release them from hardship? Now they don't have to wait for the future. We make the future. Devin nodded enthusiastically as Mei Lin silently fumed. How long do we have to deal with people like them then? demanded Carmo, jerking his chin toward the interior of the barn. 
he was a handsome, dark-skinned boy, already as tall as Zarif. As long as we battle the green cloaks, we are distracted from our true purpose of aiding our people. People like them. Malin was sure he must mean Rolan, Connor and Tariq. Once we get the talismans, they will be powerless to stand against us, Zarif said. He was briefly distracted by his reflection in the spoon. He admired it. Talia looked vexed. Just how can you be so certain? There are four other children with great beasts out there looking for the exact same thing as us. Two, corrected Devin with a smirk. These two we already have aren't getting out any time soon. My father built the Howling House to be the best. Becca and Maylin shot each other a look. Two? Who was missing? And I chose all of you to be the best, Zarif said. The four returned great beasts were summoned at random to rather unworthy human partners, as I think you saw earlier today. Each of you, on the other hand, was hand-picked to be a hero. Excellent breeding, he smiled at Devin. Exceptional intelligence. He pointed his spoon at Talia. Exceeding connections. This was directed to the girl with the lizard. And exacerbating strength, he said to Carmo. The table was quiet, probably because none of them knew what exacerbating meant, including Zarif. With the bile, Zarif continued, we can create even more worthy heroes. It creates bonds, even when the nectar fails. And the bonds are superior. The human has complete control. We choose the animal. No follower of the reptile king needs to worry about bonding with a field mouse. Long live the reptile king. The table was quiet again, and the faces of the children indicated that they had heard Zarif give this speech before. Finally, he cleared his throat, moved his plate, and produced a piece of parchment. Here's the map we got from the two urchins. Devin, you and Carmo will use this to follow them to their destination. Get the talisman. I will come find you. Carmo said dubiously, You are not joining us? Carmo, Zarif said. He stood and draped an arm across the tall boy's shoulders. Carmo, Carmo, Carmo. Now that the first stage of your training is done... It's time for me to return Talia to Stetriol and Anna to Amaya, where they can begin to inspire their people. Devon remains here in Yura, where he is most influential. And you, as we've discussed, have more work than you can do on Nilo's behalf before you go home as a hero. There are two of you, two of them. I think we can all agree that Elder and Impundulu are more than a match for that panda even with Uraza helping her. Malin gritted her teeth. There was no point in staying any longer. Punching Abeka's arm lightly, she indicated for the other girl to follow. When they returned to Finn, Malin said grimly, They're definitely conquerors, handpicked by Zarif. He says they have some sort of version of nectar that can force a bond, and they have Rolan and Connor there in the Howling House. Finn's expression went very dark. He said, At Greenhaven, we had heard rumours. There's no time to spare. We have to get the others out. What we need is a diversion. Havoc, so they don't have time to attack us. Maylin felt an idea prickle. She whispered, Keep a lookout. I need to have a moment of silence. She released G from her dormant state. The panda was dreadfully conspicuous in the dark. Not the black bits, of course, but everything white. And the blacksmith shop was not designed to fit a panda. G shifted her weight so that the anvil would stop poking her in the flank. Malin asked, G, will you help me? I think I have an idea, but I need to focus. The panda actually looked happy to be asked. Ears pricked forward, eyes brighter, mouth less tense. Melin hadn't realized before that G's face was capable of holding such expression. The moment Melin closed her eyes, the panda's calming influence washed over her. It would be easy to fall asleep, she thought. 
She could curl up in the panda's soft fur right here. Suddenly, she missed Zhang so badly that she could cry. This was all part of the panda's power, she knew, pushing down all her logical barriers. She didn't have time for it. Focusing, she shoved away the emotion. Choices swirled into view. This time they were more like stars than planets, bright and hard to look at directly. When Mei Ling considered some of them, causing a commotion with the mastiffs, sneaking in another window, attacking the guards directly, they fizzled and died out. But one choice stayed bright. Mei Lin let it circle her as she studied it from all sides, looking for dull areas or weakness. This idea isn't an easy one, she thought. Chi's encouragement washed over her. Of course she was right. Mei Lin had never needed the easy way. She opened her eyes. Well? Abeka asked. Mei Lin said, I'm going to need you to cover for me. This idea is going to take a bit of time. <laughs>